this battle for the soul of professional golf animated Tiger. It gave him a purpose. It, it brought him back in into this fold and it gave him a chance to connect with this whole other generation of Foreplay presented by Barstool Sports, brought to you by our great friends at Chevrolet, the bow tie, Chevy.com slash electric. They've been making cars for 100 years. They've been making electric cars for over a decade. Great work at Chevy.com slash electric. Uh, Alan Shipnuck's on this show. We got like an hour and 15 minutes with him. It, he's fun to talk to. He's uh, Dan talks about it you know, with him, but he's an amazing writer. His book, Live and Let Die, is all about the last, really the entire history of kind of existential threats to the PGA Tour. Live, we've talked about Live an enormous amount on this show for the last two years, and his perspective, his knowledge, his insight uh, about the entire thing is just a very, very kind of fun, insightful, riveting conversation. Obviously, he's got he butted heads with uh, Justin Thomas and a bunch of people on tour. He's got Tiger Woods stories in there. He's got all kinds of good stuff. So uh, that's kind of the meat of the show. And then other than that, we've got kind of the whole squadron here. Um, we've got a new YouTube situation. So we kind of teased this a week or two ago, but uh, we have the uh, foreplay podcast YouTube channel is now its own channel. So if you're one of the loyal 10, 20,000 people that watch the podcast on YouTube. We're going to be publishing those on a new channel for play podcast. So go follow that, subscribe to that. And that's where those are going to be. If you get lost, everything else is going to be on the original YouTube channel. Fellas. I love it. Makes it way cleaner. It's something that we've been kind of pushing for, for a long time. I mean, it's weird. YouTube is uh, a fickle little bitch. Mis- mistress. Mm-hmm. feels We're like bitch. those mm-hmm. first, like those first 30 minutes after a video drops seems to seem to like determine how the video is very yeah it's just strange like some groups and some podcasts and some um, brands have figured out the perfect streamlined way to get their videos into this algorithm obviously you listen to like mr beast on joe rogan and it's like he ha- he pays like a team of like a hundred people figuring out exactly what colors to put on their thumbnails and all these things and at the end of the day you could put out a video that's really really good um i think i thought Danny's uh, Shane Lowry video um, was incredible, and I felt I felt like it got crushed by the algorithm of us putting out a million different things at the time. Dave versus Jerry was still going crazy on YouTube; it was like hitting close to a million at that point. And then now you have all these podcasts coming out. We do two podcasts a week plus two videos a week, and I just think, and we've been told this from people behind the scenes at YouTube or that work with YouTube that they say that it doesn't know what video to push out to our fans. So you could go on your YouTube app, you can go on your TV and it'll say recommended for you. It's that first couple of videos and you won't find us for months. If you're scrolling, it's just <laughs> hidden. It's just hidden. Meanwhile, other groups and other brands, they've just figured out how to be like, this is the premiere. It comes out at this time. It's the only video you see this week. And YouTube's like, we love that. This is our premiere that we're going to show every single golf fan in the world, every single comedian fan, whatever it may be. So we're trying that out. We think that we just sometimes put out too much on the on the page. Yeah, I think it's a great move. So make sure you go subscribe to that new channel. And that'll just be where you get all the podcasts. It's going to be super clean. That's right. That's right. So yeah, go check that out. If you are a uh, watcher of the show, you're probably, you've probably figured that out at this point. You're probably watching this somewhere on, on YouTube. So you're looking at us talking about how you're going to watch it, but you're watching it. So good job. Way to get there. Uh, store.barcelsports.com. As always, we got our merchandise on. That's a great way to support us. We appreciate it. The Tiger uh, swing progression, Year of the Tiger. Uh, you know, we're very cultured, so Year of the Tiger. Uh, that's a great, great item. We got hats. We got polo, uh, polos. We got all kinds of good stuff. So a quick reminder to go in there. Check out store.barcelsports.com. The Sand Valley series rolls on. We got Mammoth Dunes, the front nine. Trent and Jersey Jerry play against uh, Frankie Borelli, I believe, four or five years ago. Mammoth Dunes was rated the best new course, I think, in the country by wow. Golf Digest, I believe, did it. Um, it's David McClay Kidd who built the original Band of Dunes course. He's been, he built Gamble Sands. He built the Castle course at uh, St. Andrews, which I believe Tom Doak rated like a zero out of 10. So he's been all over the place. He's been on this show before. He's had all kinds of ups and downs um, with like his architectural career, but he has built some of the most favorite, people's favorite kind of like publicly accessible um, golf destination courses. Like I said, Band and Gamble are two of my favorites. And Mammoth Dunes was the one that he built a handful of years ago at uh, Sand Valley. So the front nine, nine hole match between the fellas. And we just kind of continue to roll on with the Sand Valley situation on YouTube. Tom Doak, uh, it's funny that you mentioned that. He, he's he got a little salt 
Because I remember I I listened to a podcast before I went to Stream Song the first time, and he was talking about uh, like the other course, and he was like, "Yeah, they got the better piece of land." Like he was like he was like upset about it. So I I love that these architects get competitive with each other. It makes sense. It's like we're competitive with all the other YouTube golf channels. Yeah, no, he you know he's he's different. You know, like Bill Cor and Crenshaw are ve- and Gil Hans are these very sweet, like they like collaborate kind of. You know, they would be like the collaborators on the YouTube, and then. Tom Doak, like literally when he was young, wrote a book criticizing all of his colleagues. He literally like <laughs> rated all of his or all of his kind of competitors courses. And and so it's very funny, but he's been that way. He's always been like straightforward. If you're into the architectural game, I believe Andy Johnson and Fried Egg, like they have him on a lot or they even did like yeah. a show with him. Uh, so anyways, Tom Doak, you know, it's kind of like this handful of of. Uh, kind of the architecture the current contemporary architecture golf architecture like uh uh top tier is you know Doak and you got Gil Hans and you've got Core Crenshaw um you get a few other names that get thrown in there and then like you know if you're doing the Bannons and the Sand Valleys and get you know you get uh David McClay kit so anyways uh, Mammoth Dunes is one of the more playable courses that you'll ever see it's got huge fairways it's a it's a massive like property it feels like each hole is kind of its own its own like facility almost because it's it's so expansive it's really really cool so mammoth um you get jersey jerry juxtapo juxta juxtaposed against all that uh trent frankie um which i you know we didn't watch that match we were having our own match so hell of a uh, team I'm excited to watch that one yeah <laughs> the jerry and trent combo i tweeted out in real time just like their vibes and the way that they were kind of communicating you know jerry would be all the way down on the ground reading a putt and and trent would be over him and there was a couple really long lag putts that i had tweeted out that trent was rolling the rock at that place and jerry was getting fired up just having him out there is insane it's it's just a it's a movie having jersey jerry out there everything I, i went up to brendan and and all the camera guys that were with us and i was like this is a different video for you guys because it's very old school bar still where the camera has to be rolling 24 seven with this guy. Yep. Him opening up a water bottle was like funny when like, yeah, we are funny and entertaining. I would hope on the, on the, on the golf course. I think that's why we're at where we're at right now, but Jerry's a different type of funny man. He's a, yeah. he is a comedic genius with just being himself. He doesn't have to try. So like there'd be times where he'd just be walking to like, to go to the bathroom. And I'm like, you have to go film that. Like, look at the way he's walking over there. And they're like, I know, like, it was crazy. It was chaos trying to film him. So that's something to look forward to. When's that coming out? That's coming out today at 2 p.m., I assume. I think that's right. Yep. Okay. Today at 2 p.m., Barstool YouTube. I want everyone there for the premiere. I want to be in the chat. Jerry will be in the chat. He'll be there talking with everybody. It's a great match. It's a, it's a surprisingly it great match. I'm excited to watch because we were filming the three of us. It was myself, Riggs, and Lurch. We were doing like a one-on-one-on-one, which will come out, I believe, next week. So, we, yeah, yeah. I'm, I, this is all new to us as well. I just dropped a needle on the ground somewhere, so we'll see if I step on that. I got no shoes on. Or Why something. do you have a needle? I've been hanging jerseys and putting them in these shadow box, these like boxes, these like jersey boxes. I have a couple behind my setup here in the room, and I brought a couple to Borelli's tap room, which we'll get into. By the way, my dad thinks he invented something last night. Um, and I, it, it came with all these little pins and needles. You're supposed to put them into the felt, and you really get the jersey tight. And when I tell you, it came with a thousand of them. Like I only used two in each one. I put them on both arms. They look great. I got Brian Trache jersey up there. I got a Matt Duchesne jersey up there. And you got these little needles. These things are oh. nightmares, and they're Dude. they're all over the floor. Whenever you I can't buy even a dre- see them. Whenever I buy a dress shirt, I, I I don't even think I ever get all of them out. I'm just I'm pulling needles out of everything. In a and dress it comes shirt. with this little thing. What's this little thing? This little it, it looks like a monopoly piece. It's That's, like a I, thim- think you probably, I think you put that on your on your fingers so you don't stab yourself with the. Is with that the what it is? I'm pretty sure that's what wow. it is. Yeah. Because I'm trying to put. I'm. Yeah, but I thought it was a little holder. It? And there, another one just went on the ground. I thought it was a little oh. holder. Chevrolet, baby. Uh, future. We're in the future. We talk a lot about the past, the future, Italy. We did the whole deal. Ancient times, bang, fast forward. Now we're in current times. Electric vehicles. That's just it. If you're not doing electric vehicles, you're out. Guess who's been doing electric vehicles for 10 years? Chevy. You go to Chevy.com slash electric, check out a bunch of their phenomenal options like the Silverado, uh, the Bolt, the Blazer, all the good ones. An amazing company, Amer- an American company, and just you know pioneering and engineering this uh, new world 
you know, in a way that only Chevy can. It's a scary world. We're going electric. It's something that's different. It's a new, it's a new invention. It's a new frontier. And Chevy's just at the helm of it. Amazing. An amazing company with a great, with a great logo. Electric it is great, great, great logo, the bow tie. Electric vehicles for over 10 years, over a decade, they've been making electric vehicles. See, you're gonna see some other companies are popping up in there. You're thinking, oh, they're dabbling. That's great. No, no. These guys have been doing it for 10 years. They've been making cars for a century. They've been making cars since the roaring 20s. They've been making vehicles. They've been doing a great job. They're iconic. They got all those models, lines that you love. And they've been doing it in the electric game for 10 years, over 10 years. So do yourself um, you know, a real solid right now. Go to Chevy.com slash electric and check out Chevy's full EV line. What did Mr. Borelli invent? <laughs> so, yeah, we have the Borelli's Tap Room in Long Beach doing great. We've got comedy nights all the time. The list, the, the lineup of people that have come there is insane. Shane Gillis just went there. Trent and I went there to go see Shane Gillis. And, uh, you know, he's trying to think of ways during the winter. It's obviously a beach town, Long Beach. So during the winter, I think things kind of slow down over there. And it's a great Italian feel for what Long Beach never really had. It's like it's no frills. They got the new pizza oven in there. My dad's walking around with limoncello shots, the whole deal. So it's really nice. I think it's going to do well in the winter. And he's like, we need an idea. And we're kicking around some things. And he came up with this. And our guy, Keith, at Halstead Woodworks, who made our my table, he made Riggs's table, he made my mm-hmm. bar in my house. Keith the guy's is great. incredible with wood. He's basically like, you know, he's Joseph. He's Mary's husband. He's a carpenter. And uh, he came up with this idea with my dad where it was going to be a pizza holder. So it's a pizza flight. You've gotten flights of beers before. You go to a brewery and you get flights yeah, you of beer. Sample. Four different five ounce glasses. You get to try them all. Take number one, number four. So now he said these pizza holders that he, he's always had at Borelli's, they're just the four legs and the pizza goes on top. Let's put beer holders on all the legs and then you serve it all as a pizza flight. So now you can make the combination. I want that pizza with this beer and four. And you spin it around the top, you know, it has a tray on it. And, and I got a lot of responses saying that the top needs to be a lazy Susan. My dad's like, you can't, you can't please everybody. You know, I, I don't know. I know that Keith, the woodmaker is good, but he's not Geppetto. I mean, he's not, he's not uh, able to make these contraptions with gears and switching and stuff. So maybe this is just, this is just invention number one. Maybe it evolves. I think we need to patent it or spit. I think we need to patent this thing. I mean, it's got it's going to hit three million views on Twitter. By the way, this tweet that I put. Yeah, up dude, I'm looking dad. at it. It's got fourteen thousand likes. Oh yeah, no, people are like, <laughs> people are like, who, I mean, who uh, gave it the jet fuel? I just tweeted it out last night. Not one, the no big baby. cat, no Dave, nothing, no, no retweet. There's usually some jet fuel. If that's just on its own merit, that's incredible. It's a good idea, and the it way is. he, you have to watch the video. He, his sale, his salesmanship is incredible. He nailed it. He's never made a video like that ever. One take. He was he was screaming. He was so into it. Cool. Um, it's a great idea. I do think that some people were saying like you should put a post in the middle on the bottom and the whole thing can swivel. You can kind of spin it around. Mm. So like a base. I love it, but I do think it needs a little bit more mobility. So a lot of people are saying like I don't if I have that slice on that side, I don't want to have to spin the whole entire thing. But the, the thing that you're not realizing is it comes on a pizza tray. So you just spin the pizza tray. It's like the a pizza doesn't Susan. go flat on the wood. Yeah, it comes mm-hmm. on a pizza tray, so the pizza t- tray spins. I see. So that's guess, the lazy. I, I that's the lazy the, Susan aspect. But the beer, right. I get. If the if the legs could shift, I mean, that'd be great. Mm-hmm. But again, I don't know that we're working <laughs> with like a Pinocchio maker here. Right. Right. But Eventually, I do think if there's, if there's a if there's a stick, a rod in the middle, and that's the base, then the whole thing kind of gets lifted off the ground, and it all shifts. You do you need lose. a way, right? You do need a way to get from one beer to the next without shifting the whole thing. I think. Right. You're also hoping that like two people order it, right? So like, well, that's what I was kind of thinking. Oh. It's like, no, you get your beer, and that like they just set it, you know, like in the order that you got the beer. So if you're on the left right. corner, you get the left corner beer. Like, <laughs> yeah, that, that's you, man. I don't that's know that. Post. Like, I don't know that the the stand needs to be moving that much. I don't know. Like, it's right. If me and That's you, Trent, point. are sitting at the table yep. and you, I say, I want, and they're a little flights, so they're a little taste. And I say, I want to try these two. And Trent wants to try those two. They're going to put those two on my side. They're going to put those two on your side. And then we're going to move the pizza around. We're going to enjoy it. And it's an appetizer. It's a little starter. It's not like, it's not the, it's, it's the, it's the beginning, you know, it's the and opening. I, I will say I'm looking here like Mr. Borelli, who, you know, is uh, a middle-aged man is 
is he's able moved. to just move that thing whenever <laughs> he that wants. Thing nice. It's not that difficult. It's I think just... you put a little felt on the bottom. It kind of gives it a little <laughs> movement, and then I think we're good. I love the idea of the two and two, yeah. where I yeah, have two, nice. you have two, we eat the pizza. I don't think you have to go crazy with it, actually. I think and, it's and, and Keith, like, put the logo on top and epoxied it. It's nuts. So, you know, for a little Italian tap room in Long Beach, it's getting a lot of pub right now, but I thought it was a good idea, and I was proud of the guy. You know, at 64, I went to Italy. He's back here scheming. The guy's making moves. So it, it was fun. Fun he's to say. Dead. He's my dad, scheming. My dad was in uh, was in town last week, last week, and he was showing me all the new tricks on his iPhone. And oh. he said something. He said something that was very interesting to me. He said, you know, Dan, getting old is when you decide not to keep up with technology anymore. So it's my true. dad has been like watching like youtube like videos to stay up with technology which i thought what kind was, of technology you know, is he like is like he's pretty good with computer he's pretty good with computers like he's pretty good with like the iphone and knowing what you can send and like what you can do which i thought was pretty impressive like you're right my dad's you're not 64 i think my dad's 67 you gotta you gotta you gotta stay young somehow my dad uh clearly had a phase i think he's out of it now but he he was uh he he had figured out the zoom in feature on when you take photos yeah and, oh god that's dangerous. And he loved it, man. And every photo he would send to the group text was just really zoomed in. And I could tell – you could tell that he was just enjoying the fact that you just go like this with the two fingers. <laughs> it is And cool. you zoom in, and he's like, that is fucking awesome. And he just would send picture after picture zoomed in. <laughs> yeah, my dad recently got into the camera. My mom and my dad went to a casino, and we in the group chat, we just got so many pictures of my mom sitting at a slot machine. Just like, here she is <laughs> yeah. at this one. Here she is at that one. It's like, awesome, dude. This is great. Yeah, I just get yeah. to see my mom sitting at a slot machine. <laughs> we cool. were talking about, so I went over <laughs> for dinner on uh, Tuesday or Monday, and when, right when we got back from Italy, and I was telling my parents about it, brought them back some gifts, and told them about the Sistine Chapel. They had been there. And I was like, yeah, you know, like they said it was supposed to be a holy room, completely quiet, and it was loud. They're like, yeah, yeah, same with us. And I was like, I snapped a selfie in there. Like I just had to. My dad's like, I brought my iPad in there. He had an iPad. <laughs> he had an iPad. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> I'm going to take this. I'm going to yep. take these videos. Got it. Yep. Just got it. Uh, I had a guy. I was at a uh, um, golf course last weekend, and it was like just after sunset, so it was dark. And a couple guys in a cart stop. They, you know, were fans of the channel. We'd love to take a picture. I said, okay. And the guy's taking the picture. And it was pitch black out at this point. And I said, oh, you probably want to turn that flash on. The guy goes, no, no, it's all good. I got one of the new phones. And I didn't know what that meant. And then he showed me the picture. And it was, I mean, it was like he had a flash on, but it never flashed. Like there was Dude, never a the light. New and I was phones. like, well, how did it, where did it get the light from to take that, to light it up? I didn't understand. I, I showed the Trent phones. That. Am I able to do that? Yeah, remember that one time you took we took that photo when you pissed like on that green field? Am I just making that up? <laughs> Is this a dream? I'm gonna here, need more think? context. <laughs> I don't know where we were and I don't know what we were doing, but we were in like a we were on a hill somewhere. You pissed it on green fields and we your were on a hill trip? somewhere, about to go into like dinner or something, and it was a super like expansive landscape. And we were like, oh, shit. And I showed you how to do that, like, nighttime photo. Remember where you can, like, see all the stars coming in? I definitely, like, basically you hold it and, like, the arrow will move around. It's like a cross. Oh. And I'm like, hold it, hold it. And you're like, and then you took it and it's insane. Yeah, I don't remember and I think you we went and took a piss and you, like, tried it for yourself. And you're like, look at this photo. Might have been yeah, the new phones are crazy. So it may have been got, Australia. Yeah, our guys got the the gimbals. You know those like mobile cameras that you can move around with. I'm pretty mm -hmm. sure the new phone has a setting that does that. A where you are, mode. No, no, no. You're like moving it. It levels it, so you could be walking, oh. taking a, a video, and it will like you know how the gimbal automatically stabilizes the camera. I'm, right. I saw a video where it will stabilize. I saw that. You could be walking around something and it looks like you have a gimbal. I uh, so. yeah, I noticed too. With my, I got this probably a year ago, so I don't know what number it is, whatever this phone, but I noticed when I film, because like with the Daily Nine and crap where I just set my phone film, it it will move if it believes that it's it's missing the shot a little bit. It will like move to have a slightly better shot. Really? It's fucking crazy. And you can, I can see it in post. I'll have to find one of the clips, but like the phone on its own will literally like barely move a fraction to get the to get it in frame better. It's fucking crazy. I got to come up with a foot because I've looked I've, at some of the footage. But the like new iPhone that, how... that just came out has like 24 times zoom, which is essentially like one of those. Like they show 
during the Apple um, keynote like announcement video, they showed what a 24x camera looks like or 24 millimeter, I guess it is. And um, it's one of those huge ones you see in the, in the little yeah. dugouts at, at Yankee games. Like you, it's the huge fucking lenses. And then they show that next to the iPhone. It's the same lens. And they yeah. figured it out with like bending a bunch of mini mirrors. So like it goes off one mirror and then goes back into another mirror and then goes into this mirror. So it's taking all of that light and bouncing it a million times inside this iPhone Instead of having you know all that space, they create that space with the space they have. If that makes it's any sense, it's amazing how much it's amazing how much it does. It's amazing how much the video, like video, the camera has become like the main selling point for the iPhone because it's the it's the engine for this whole like creator content creator yeah, economy. Yeah. Like I remember when they were first coming out, it was like, oh my god, you could go on the internet or like you could stream. But now it's like you can take a TikTok video and it will stabilize for you. So you don't need a professional camera anymore. You can just do it all with your iPhone. Well, shout out to the actual photographers who are still killing it because you take for granted, like at this point, regular iPhone vid- photos and videos look amazing. And like to just yeah. the, the average person, like my video, my photos in Italy, for, I look yeah. back at them. I'm like, they look professional. They're fucking professional. But then you have, then some, then sometimes you come across those, really good ones right like you you follow our guy jp at um taylor yep. made yeah and you're just like or ollie and you see their photos that they put up dane at dane all these guys these photos that they're able to put up you're like that's different that is different what it does though is it makes it easier these phones make it so much easier for us frank you remember when we were taking promo pictures for the rider cup merch at Pirelli's, yeah and Brendan had the camera. We were taking all these pictures and then we took one picture with the iPhone and it just makes everything look the way that you want it to look. It had it makes the lighting it... involved. It had the saturation. We didn't have it's... to like go back and edit anything. We didn't need like a lighting studio. It just made everything so simple. You're right. Yeah. I have the new iPhone. And I just, I, it's wasted on me, dude. It's optimized I, I, the new, for new social one, media. 15? I got the new, new. Wow. I got to get the new, new. I think Fuck I man. need the new, feel new. better in your hands. Light, right? <sighs> It right. feels the same. I use the same case. It's the same size. I don't know. Oh, uh, yeah. I'm up two cases. Titanium. It's, uh, that means nothing. I had to get yeah. a case because when I got this new phone like a year ago, I dropped it within two days and the whole back of it shattered, which is way better than the front of it. But I was like, all right, I need fucking something. I dropped this thing in a hot tub in uh, Italy and it went to the bottom. I thought the trip was over. It was, the, it was actually two weeks ago from today. It was last Wednesday, two Wednesdays ago. And uh, I was like, oh, I looked around. I looked at him. I said, that. I said, trip's over. Third day into the trip, it's over. My, I, I sat around for a second as it was at the bottom. I didn't like frantically go and get it. <laughs> yeah. I looked, yeah. up, I looked up the sky. I'm like, and then it was fine. It's completely waterproof. It's nuts. It's also like That's if you can't document crazy. a trip like that, there's really no point in going. I believe that. 100%. I actually had a conversation with her like halfway through the trip where I was like, at some point, this can't just be about getting the perfect picture. You know what I mean? Like, you gotta, we took, I know, like, a, mi- we took a million photos at every single thing like together. It's like, I don't like my arm. I don't like the way I'm standing. And I'm that way too. Like I looked at one. I'm like, all right, no, do another one, do another one, do another one. And it's like, at some point, it can't be only about that, but you do need them because that's your memory of it. My memory shot. So I need to go back and it's look at it. It's an interesting balance because at some point you are in Rome, you know, you're yeah. just in Rome. I went in Rome. I miss you're in, you should so enjoy times, Rome. Dude. Not like through the lens of your camera. I should have made also, that close to the pin. How many times do you think I said when in Rome? I mean, it was <laughs> it was like forty seven times, dude. I every remember. single shot, every drink, every sip, every cheer. When in Rome? When in Rome? And I went. You know, <laughs> yeah. I said it to the waiter once. He's like, "Fuck." He's, he's like, "I heard that, that twenty eight so million fuck. times today." Fuck. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I I remember like three years ago, I was at dinner and I had a girlfriend at the time. And, you know, I get a lot of shit for just being on the phone all the time, which is our job, but everybody kind of is, whatever. And I was like, I'm going to do a no phone dinner. And I just put my phone in my back pocket, put it on silent. No, Shaking. Two and a half hour dinner. When I turned that phone back on, probably the first time in four months, I had like three text messages from Dave Portnoy that were just. <laughs> yep. And I said to her, that's why we can't do no phone dinners. I was like, but that's the only reason that's like, you know, and it. Oh, it was just like you I think can't, he knows. Just, I think he's got that's one. Of, he's got like ten senses. Sense. That's I was one of them. Super nervous about being in Italy. I mean, that everything was going on at the office. There was a surviving bar stool was happening, yeah. and I was like, I'm just out here lounging for. A that week. was probably good for you though, because I was in the office and I was watching them film there was surviving so much bar stool. Going on, and there's he's, they were all so into it that they like 
they weren't thinking about what was going on. on the I just thought world. because everyone was together, someone was going to be like, when's this guy getting back? You know what I mean? It, towards the oh, end, yeah. it was like, let's get home. <laughs> you know, I was like, with, <laughs> in Venice, I'm like, let's get home. Oh. It feels like we've gotten too lucky here. <laughs> the, one time I, the one time I took a nap, uh, Tiger Woods got a DUI. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, that's right. <laughs> Just That's a nightmare. Right. I woke up from a nap and I was like, "I'm thirty. Mi- I'm thirty minutes late on that, and that might as well be a year." <laughs> yeah. My, so, I uh, should I? Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I remember I found out about the PGA Tour PIF merger from an Erica Nardini text that just said, "Holy shit!" And I, oh. in my head, I was like, "Did Tiger Woods die? Did like Dave Portnoy get arrested? Like, I don't know." It just she just texted me, "Holy shit!" And I and I was like, what, 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 what? Because there were three hours behind here. So it was like fucking, it was like 6 a.m. when all that news broke. And I fucking, I look on Twitter, Yasser and fucking Monahan are on an interview <laughs> together. I was like, what, 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 what is going on here? So it's like, you just, it is, it's almost like the universe has that spidey sense of like, oh, you thought you could check out, didn't you? You thought you could check out. You can't, you, ne- you nope. never can. You never can. Should we do my closest to the pin? Yeah. Yes. Let's do let's do closest to the pin, baby. Okay. Closest to the pin segment. My first uh submission. So I am gonna Yep, go Frankie, ahead. Frankie, just we have to um once you once you do it, then we text Alex Bush our answer and then yep. we reveal them. Holy shit. Okay, and I'm giving all the information that I have that I think you guys need. We think Beautiful. that's the fairest way to do it, you know? Yeah, I think that's the fairest way as to do it. As long as it's all accurate. Yeah. Okay. My first closest to the pin question is how much money will the new movie that's coming out this weekend, The Killers of the Flower Moon, make at the box office this weekend? Wow. So for so that's reference, like, that's the official that's like the official statistic that they release is the weekend. Yeah, so it's a it's a Leonardo DiCaprio, Martin Scorsese, Robert De Niro, the new big movie of the year. For reference, I'm going to give you guys one reference that I looked up once upon a time in Hollywood, when that came out, made forty million dollars that weekend. That was a Tarantino movie. It had everyone in it: Leo, all the guys, Brad Pitt. So I want to base that information. I want to get that information off, and you guys can base it off of that. I don't know if that was I, too much information. But I got to tell no, you, I'm that's grateful good. for that information because yep. that pulls me back. I probably shouldn't earth. have. I probably shouldn't have given that. It to altered you. my guess for sure. It like, did. shouldn't we mm. all just be able to search it? Like, shouldn't we get like a minute to search our own stuff? You, yeah, yeah. I, the other be- the beauty of it is like, that I was, was great thinking, research like, by me. It's kind of an opportunity for the person delivering the questions to you could give whatever inf- you could get false information. Like I know no. you'll get you'll get shit on for it, but like you oh. could in theory just give false information. And like, yeah, like seven, like seven preseason games. This is a three yeah, and a half like, hour movie. Martin Scorsese, Killers of the Flower Moon. What do we think? So I'm gonna text Alex Bush. Yep, I'm in. Okay, ah. I'm gonna text Bush. Ah, I don't feel good about it, but I mine's in. Okay, <sighs> fuck, I don't feel good about mine either. Fuck. My second question. Wait, wait, shouldn't we go? Do we go around? Oh, oh, because we locked it in. We do yeah. reveal once we lock. Oh, and we can okay. lock it in. Is everyone locked? I'll go first. Locked. I'll go first. Everybody's locked and loaded. Yes, mm-hmm. I said fifty-one million United States dollars. Wow. Okay, I did. I did sixty-nine million. Wow, felt like a good number. I, I feel like the movies are back, right? With don't Barbie get and, and don't get Barbie get and uh, you know Trent. What did you and, say? What was the other one? Barbie and Oppenheimer. Everything, Oppenheimer. Everyone's going to the Trent, what'd you say? I fucked up, man. <laughs> what'd you say? <laughs> I said thirty-four million. Oh, that would be I, a went, lot. I went lower. Okay, because I oh, I honestly wow. think a Tarantino movie, which you which you reference, mm-hmm. that's more that's going to get more. I get that it's Scorsese and Leo and De Niro, but Tarantino doesn't drop you that often. Me. He's very popular. You fucked so me I w- because I wanted everyone to be in the fifties and the sixties. Well, I'm here, bitch. I, I, said, tw- I said twenty nine million. Mm-hmm. See, now I'm panicking too. I could I, just see like there hasn't been that much promo for it. You guys hadn't. I saw it on your face. You guys hadn't even heard about this movie until I just said it. And it's out no, tomorrow. I know about this. Movie, I but. I heard in general terms, but I didn't know it was coming out this weekend. It doesn't it also, have that. Once upon a time in Hollywood was like you got to be there and see that. I movie. went. I never go to the movies when Tarantino comes out. I go. Right. Yeah, and Barbie and Oppenheimer have the the name, the like there was How all kinds they of do? hoopla. They were building up on each other like that. This doesn't have that. Killers of the Moonflower, like or that's not Oppenheimer. <laughs> Bro, I think opening. Barbie did like eighty million in the first weekend. Oppenheimer did killed. 
Oppenheimer did 82 million. 69 million was a horrible oh guess. Oh. It was a horrible guess by me. Opening weekend, 80 million. That's, I mean, it's a way bigger I'm movie. I'm way off Way here. bigger movie. Yeah, but is, it, is Oppenheimer three or four times bigger yeah. than Killer of Oppenheimer the and Moon? Barbie was like everyone knew they were coming out. Bro, Barbie they had did 162 a million its first yeah, weekend. Yeah, I can't talk about that. Okay. What? It's first weekend? Yes. I just looked it up. <laughs> What? All That's right. Sickening. All right. Oh, um, now we're back in all of a sudden. I feel like I'm I back asked in. I asked a question. Now. I okay. probably had the worst answer. All right. <laughs> I, I did that the whole time the first time. I entered, I created the fucking thing and I, I didn't get Second a point. Second question. Until you stepped on a scale. So now I don't know who's going to be in net tomorrow for the New York Islanders against the New Jersey Devils, but I'm going to guess that it's Elias Sorokin. They have three days off in between games. They're playing the Devils. They're at home. It's a Friday night. I'm saying how many saves will the New York Islanders goalie have? tomorrow night against the new jersey devils for reference he has played two games he's two and oh he had 26 saves the first game and 14 saves and a shutout last night over his career elias Sorokin has a 27.4 saves per game statistic so they're playing the devils high octane offense friday night lights prime time hockey at ubs islanders are undefeated you got to think they're going with Sorokin. What are you guys guessing that Sorokin has for saves? This might actually fuck me because he's going to like get. How about I've done now. both times. I've, I've written in my little notes app, my, my guess. And then when I text Bush, I change it last second. And then I have to go back into the notes app and change it. But I'm mine submitted. I'm locked and loaded. I'm locked. I'll go first. 29 saves. Okay. I think the, I think the the Devils. I, I don't know shit about hockey, but I think the Devils are going to have a lot of shots, and he's going to save twenty nine of them. <laughs> yeah, you do. Yeah, you fucking. Do. I said even more. I said thirty two saves. Wow. Oh, I think they're going to be. Fuck. I think they're going to be firing. I think they're going to be firing at uh, Iliad Sorokin. That's going to be Iliad. He's special. Said, he told I, me yesterday he's special. Go ahead. Yeah, he go go ahead. He is special. Go ahead, Riggs. I got pinched. I said thirty one. Oh, I said. Brutal. I said thirty three. Oh. Wow. Uh, see, I would have loved throwing. to have said 33. Uh, I got anything over 32 now. Right. I'm I'm pinched too. I'm pinched. He's got to land 32 exactly. I just think it's it might go to overtime. I think this game is going to be a great game. I could see I could see New Jersey firing 40 shots on goal. Okay. Should we do All the right. dozen rules where if you get it spot on, you get two points? Oh, that'd be cool. I mean, for the for like the box office, that's pretty fucking good. If you get that, that would be that'd be unbelievable. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Let's do that. You get it spot on, and then you know that that'll kind of weight questions too. Like if you do one like Dan did last week, where it was like, "What is Tom Kim's score going to be on the ninth hole?" Somebody's probably going to get that right. But that guess what? That's a big question. True, it's a big moment. My third submission is the Zozo Championship. Adam Scott, what will his combined score be Thursday and Friday mm. at the Zozo? So his his score in relation to par. After no Friday. total number. Okay. Total strokes. What's total the, what's strokes. The par? Do we know what the par is? I don't know. I'm just going total. I'm going Love total it. strokes. Danny, as we've talked about, par is a myth. Par, par is a par social is contract. Irrelevant. Social par contract. Is, yeah. It's a contract. Yep. That's what I meant. Dan, you just fell right into that one. You know, yeah, you're just a sheep out me. there. That's just, bad. Uh, bad. Yeah. Just a okay. slave to the scoreboard. Okay, that's right. Uh, da, 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 da. I'm doing a lot of math in my head. I know. I got to do Same. math now. I'm, I'm I pulled locked. out the calculator. Me too. What's up? <laughs> do you guys, how often do you guys pull out the calculator app over a uh, uh, a bill, like a, a dinner or? Every time. Every time. And people okay. look at me because okay. like I, my family has a restaurant, so they think like I always know how much to leave for the tip. <laughs> and I'm always like underneath the table being like 25%. Like I'm always, always. doing it. I'm like, oh, I think we should leave that. And they're like, cool, this guy knows about tips. He's the tip guy. All right. All right. Do you guys locked in? Lead us off, Frankie. Um, hold on. I'm going to eat some. What did yeah, I say again? Okay. okay. Adam Scott okay. at the Zozo on Thursday and Friday will have strick, strucken, struck, struck the ball. Struck. 138 times. I think I'm getting squeezed here. <sighs> Literally the, the same. same yes. I said the same number. <laughs> no <laughs> way. I have 139. Thank you very much. Oh, oh shit! No. Oh no! What'd you guys? You what'd you guys can't. do in your in your head? Did you guys do 68, 70? Yep. No. <laughs> I yep, couldn't do that I much. I went. Uh, all I could do was 
70 times two is 140, and then I just took a couple off that. <laughs> Solid. All right. <laughs> That's all I anything of anything 139 or above, I'm golden. What'd you say? 139? I said 139. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> Tell yeah. me he gets 138, though. We all get two. That yeah, would be yeah, nice. Get and Dan gets zero. All right. That was a good one. Well, okay. And here is my last one. I tried to pick a random NFL team, and I say, how many points will the Detroit Lions score this week against the Baltimore Ravens? The Lions are hot. They're 5-1, oh, and one, first in the NFC North. They are actually underdogs against the Ravens. The over is 41 and a half. Bush, how many I just, points? Oh. Bush, I just want to take a moment again to remind everyone that you were 30 points off on the Bills. Fuck yeah. off. <laughs> yep. You're only, oh, uh, did you guys do a, a Bills one last week? Yeah, we did. How many points would they score against the Giants? And he said 44. Oh. <laughs> yeah, and they got 14. 14. Yeah. yeah. All right, so yeah. we're going to keep I, this going with the NFL. I like it. You're only uh, – the only one you've participated in, Bush, you were last place in the guessing. So, just, so they've scored yeah, 21, it's, it's 31, 20, 34, <laughs> 42, and 20. All over the place. All over. And they're playing the Ravens in Baltimore. And the over under is right. low, yeah. very low. Forty one, you said. Yeah, that's really low. That that's what the over under is. It says it's forty. By the way, I saw this the other day. Uh, the the Iowa Hawkeyes, the football team, they have been involved in six of the last seven lowest over under totals in college football history. Fuck, they, What's their re- isn't their record pretty good though? Six and one, baby. Yeah, yeah. It's that's the crazy. weirdest. It's potentially the weirdest team. In all of football history. And they're weird every year because we have no offense, because Brian Ferentz doesn't know what he's doing, but our defense is very good. It's, it's our, we lost Cade McNamara. We, he's the quarterback. It's the weirdest team to follow. They're going to go to the Big Ten Championship and get slaughtered by Michigan. It's, it happens every two years. Um, I had a number in my head for this. All right. I, I'm locked in. All right. Trump, lead us off. 24 points. Me yeah. too. Fucking hell. Dude. Wow. We need to get, we need to get brains of our own. It's, um, those those numbers that you threw out were all over the place, so I just kind of went right down the middle. Right in the middle. Riggs? Yeah. What did Trent say? 24. Why should that? That doesn't matter, okay. by the way. No, no, I yeah, know. I yeah. nervous. I, That's a little sketchy I already, question. I already texted Bush. What do you mean? All right. No, you can't go back at this point. That's I just want to know question. because last time Trent made a guess, I went crazy and had the same guess at the same time. Uh, 20. I said 20. Ooh. 28. 28. Wow. So anything in the 30s, I win that. Feels wow. like they're going to be in the 30s. I don't know, man. The uh, over under is 41 and a half, and they're underdogs, three points. Detroit Lions, Kent. I always say Detroit, and my friends always yeah, make fun of me for it. I don't know why Detroit. I say that. It just, I'll never forget. I'll, it's something, it's like Dave with, uh, with Misogenic. Misogenic. I'll never be able to not say Detroit, Rock City, ever. Detroit. It's, I know. My buddy Kyle hates when I say Detroit. He's like, why do you say that? So it's not a Long Island thing. No, no, okay. I I don't know why I say that. I'll never understand why I say that. I think I mean it has a better flow. Detroit Lions sounds cooler than Detroit. The Detroit Lions. Like Ly- he's yeah, like he's that's a little insane. bit of respect on the Big D. I kind of like it. <laughs> like, I'll say it all the time. I'm like oh, I'm going to Detroit this week. He's like, why are you saying that, Detroit? All right, so all right, the Detroit we're, Lions. We're in, and that's it. Those are our four. Does Alex Bush get to go, or or he filled in because I wasn't there? He just why? he just did the Bills one. He yeah, we was... should let him go in the future, maybe. We should let him go in the future. Yeah, he's already heard all our answers. Yeah, he can't. Yeah. Know. Yeah, we'll get you. That's on that's on us, Bush. We uh, you know, we're kind of evolving this new segment at, a, each week, but Bush, you can play going forward, so you gotta sharpen those guessing skills. It also tests your quick internet research abilities. I feel like I gave you guys too much information for the movie one. Yeah, I think going back, if you well, had asked me what that movie was going to make, I probably would have said two hundred million. I know, <laughs> I know, <laughs> I fucked up. I fucked up pretty bad. I shouldn't have said that. People are not going to be happy that I said that because that's once like, upon a time in Hollywood was the perfect comp too. Wasn't perfect, like you gave us right. like the Barbie number. Yeah, was like, that was good. Yeah. That was good. <clears throat> Let's go one thirty eight, Adam Scott. You know, let's just do I that know. first. That would days. be incredible. Sixty eight seventy. Make the mm-hmm. cut. Mm-hmm. Uh, all right. A couple other things. Uh, we're locked and loaded on there. Um, Ivor Robson, the uh, 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 iconic starter at the Open Championship. Everybody knows his voice, face, the whole deal. Uh, passed away. He was 83. That's an excellent, excellent run. But he was iconic. So I saw that. Uh, very, very sad when I saw it. I saw Tiger Woods tweeted about it. Uh, and then that, the montage that they had of him doing just everybody over the so last good. however many years was so like heartwarming and what a what a like 
amazing thing to be known for as you're just you've been the guy that stood there all day long people conjectured forever how does he go to the bathroom does he train his bladder for 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 weeks leading up to that to stand out there from sunrise to sunset just announcing people so um so uh rest in peace to uh, him he was an absolute icon in the game icon a lot of memories of waking up crack of dawn on the tee from usa tiger woods he was kind of scott hansen before scott hansen when you talk about the the bladder control oh wow you that's know? a good point eight eight really hours of maybe even more i mean the the open they got tea times at like 4 p.m so he was like close to 12 hours or you know 10 hours <laughs> um legend uh netflix cup so the netflix cup was announced uh a lot going on kind of with formula one formula one and uh the the red bull team and taylor made golf kind of uh teamed up i saw some really really sweet stuff from our from our guys at taylor made and then it was also announced that november 14th i think dan's going i potentially gonna go but i'm doing this hundred hole hike at pebble beach like the day before so it's gonna be a little bit of a grind for me to get there but i might go because it's not very far from where i live but they're kind of continuing. This is like the same kind of crew that did the original Tiger Phil match, and they keep kind of evolving. They did Rogers, and they've done Steph Curry, and they've all kinds of different folks. Now they're doing Formula One in Vegas on November 14th. It's the Netflix Cup. Max Homa, Kawa Morikawa, JT, Ricky, and then you got Alban, um, Gasly, Norris, and Sa- uh, Carlos Sainz, uh, who are anybody who watches Drive to Survive, you know who those guys are. So they're doing like a little – uh, deal at the win, which seems where like where they're doing all these matches. Everything's now. at the win, yeah. It's like the they golf fucking, course. They love that spot. Uh, but yeah, I, I'm excited for the sphere to make a big. Like I see it all over fucking social media, but I, I feel like it's going to have a big presence in this event. And when they do the Formula One and all that, so I'm pretty excited to see what the sphere's got because I feel like it's been kind of holding its cards in a little bit. I think that thing's going to pop that week. Yeah, I think that's I think that's the week of the race, right? That's the week of the yeah, I'm pretty sure the it's race the week of the, the Formula weekend. One. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. It's Netflix's first ever live sports event, so you know you've seen a lot of the other streamers get into that. Netflix has not done that yet. They've they've gone they've invested in sports, but in the documentary format, they have a documentary on it seems like every sport now. But now this is their first live event, so could be a you know a, a peek into the future of of what Netflix might look like. Did they try and do a live like premiere of one of the finales, and it just did not something come. failed right i yeah, was not blind, well. maybe yes that was it and it's just like technologically it's just like they it didn't was get delayed it right. for a long First, time like, yeah. 15 minutes was just nothing and everyone around the world was like how do we not see this finale i also yeah. think they streamed um chris rock's latest stand-up special but this is their mm. first foray into sports yeah like how do you guys feel about that about them getting into sports live sports i i you know i think that eventually these streaming companies are just slowly becoming the cable companies just with a different a different like way of delivering it to you. You know, I see that Netflix is like starting all these different tiers where it's like you're going to be able to have like a basic, basic subscription that might actually have ads. So they're going to start selling ads. And then it's basically just like a network that you get on an app as opposed to just like on a TV channel. Isn't that just going to be cable? And like, right, that's what I'm saying. That's the what joke I'm saying. The, the joke for the last couple of years has been, I can't find any of this stuff. Wouldn't it be easier if we just put them all together <laughs> in the same place? And it's, it's, it's kind of true, especially probably for the older generation where they're like, I got Hulu, I got Netflix, I got Max, I got all these different things, and I don't know how to get to them. It does seem, it's so funny how the pendulum swings where for a long time it was cut the cord and get all these different things. Oh, it's like a la carte. You can kind of pick what you want. And now it would almost be easier for some people if you just put it all together. So, well, they've run into a wall with the subscriptions. So if you're, all of these companies are not, their, their su- subscriber base isn't growing. So how else are you going to make more money if you don't start selling ads? You know what I mean? Right. So and it's like, like, yeah, they're spending I've never all this understood money. How do they justify once? And they have so much money. I'd love to speak to someone that actually knows how they justify like new projects. So they like a Netflix will come out with a new series and it costs them whatever the number is, 250, 300 million dollars to produce this series, right? And like how are they justifying all that with like not as much new money coming in? Is it just like the pool of money just stays there and they just continue Well, they lose to, money. They I lose think they money. lose money. Yeah, so I think it, it, yeah, but they're yeah. also getting like every month they're getting every month. X amount in revenue for right. our fifteen right, bucks right, right. times fucking a hundred million people or whatever it is. So it's like But it's one of the reasons why they like that format, like the the, the docuseries format is they're way cheaper to produce. Well, and it's always yeah. a way to grow a base is always been live sports. If you can get the rights to live sports, that's guaranteed. That's like the one thing left where everyone is gonna watch it together and you're gonna get people because they wanna watch 
it's a little different when you make up a new event like this Netflix cup. But if you're trying to get like football rights or baseball rights or hockey, rights, what happened with Apple with foot with Messi? Yeah, they got all the rights crazy. to the MLS. Boom. Explosion. I want to see Messi. I want to see a Messi game. He man. got hurt, right? I think he's, he's not been it, playing yeah. the last couple of weeks. He played for Argentina last night though. Yeah. Okay. Cause I know like uh, his guys- team just lost every game that he hasn't played in. He doesn't really play on turf. He doesn't. He doesn't like to play on AstroTurf. So he's Love like, it. which I get. Yeah, good like for that. him. I, uh, yeah, their you guys subscriber watch base this, went up uh, by like five hundred percent or something. Yeah, something crazy. Do you guys watch the Beckham documentary yet? Yes. No, but I heard Not it's yet. good. Not yet. Really, really, really good. good. Really yeah. good. The only yeah. my only um my only issue now with all these documentaries that are coming out is that they are all like a little too fluff piece on the person that they're covering they're and all executive producers that's like that's i'm that trend is it's almost like when i was watching 24 and like each new season of 24 was awesome but by like the third or fourth you kind of like a couple episodes in sniffed out exactly who the rat was going to be exactly who the double agent was going to be and you knew and it's a little bit like you get these controversial kind of like figures where they did it with urban meyer they did it with johnny football where it's like you just they present it in a way where they're they're purely sympathetic like there's almost no way to feel any other way and that's my only negative but otherwise the david beckham documentary is fucking fantastic it's really yeah, good that guy's, that guy's a star uh, i mean maybe the star of all stars but you're right i mean that's kind of the trade-off that you're that you're getting and i think it started with um the last dance yep which is like you know these yeah. people they'll make these documentaries and they'll sit down with you for hours and hours and they'll give you all of this archival footage of them when they were kids but they get the final say but, so, the Jeter I, yeah. one, the captain one, I was disappointed with because I'm such a big Jeter guy. It felt like it was just a recap of all the best games. It was basically one of those DVD box sets of the Yankees World Series. It, there was no, there was no like footage that they had in the Last Dance. The Last Dance was the best one because they yeah. showed stuff that you couldn't see. Him laying yeah. down in his yep. hotel room, saying like, "I don't want to do this anymore. I'm getting tired of this shit." I, I, yeah, I also I, like. I feel like Jordan is the only guy that you he. There's like. F- three people who you want to set that precedent with where it's like the only way we're going to do this is with jordan because he's going to give us access and people actually want to hear from him the guy like beckham i like beckham seems like a great guy i'm sure the documentary was great it's like do we need him involved fully i get i get that's going to make it better in a certain way but in another way it's going to make it worse I think he's a big enough global superstar where That's that fair. probably did huge number. I mean, he is yeah, like, he, dude, he, uh, in like, I, I'm a big, I, I could get really into documentaries where I don't know what happened. So like for me, like I loved the Lakers one that they just canceled on HBO because like, I didn't know who won or lost every year. I had no idea. So every game, I'm like hanging on the fucking edge of my seat like it's in real time. And it was the same. So that with- red card was news to you. No fucking clue. I was like, when the guy, <laughs> dude, when they Whoa, said. Whoa, don't spoil it. Yeah, true, true. <laughs> it is. It had me. I was throwing things at my TV. I was like, boo. I was like, that That got me riled up, man. And, and, and so, yeah, it's like experiencing kind of like iconic sports moments like they're happening in real time because you don't know the result is fucking unbelievable well, that was I a think. huge draw to drive to survive yeah yeah i pay no now everybody pays attention to it so you kind of know what happens but when you watch that first season you're like i know nothing about this sport and i don't know who wins i don't even know how they win like that's how people had no idea what was going on so it is cool when that happens is beckham still coming across your radar on like a daily basis is he still a superstar only he, because the mess stuff yeah he runs inter miami oh he like I just you haven't know, heard about Beckham pictures in, a long in time. yeah he's older he's like f- whatever fifty or something now so he's still it, so hot it, he is really hot it's fucking amazing in the documentary too they like when they interview opposing players and stuff and they'd be like he was so good looking that we fucking hated him <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they just, you know, yeah and they're and they're like they talk to I think it's like the Bayern Munich and one of the guys is like. We were all ugly, and he was so good looking that it gave us an edge. <laughs> we wanted to fucking kill yeah. him. And all of the, all of, he was yep. like, he was talking about how there was like a headline in uh, in the Spanish newspaper that was like Beckham, like muy bella, but muy fea. Uh, sorry, it's like muy bella, but muy mal, which means like very good looking, but very bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and he's like, 
Yeah, and he, you know, he's immediately dating like the hottest Spice Girl, and they're all over the place, and he's wearing outrageous outfits. Like I just didn't know any of that was occurring. I was t- I was ten years old. I wasn't so so. Yeah, witnessing that stuff that you don't know what happened is is better. It's almost like oh, I like that stuff more than a lot of the the uh, full swing stuff because it's like you already you know you like witnessed it, so it's like cool to recap it. And we're into golf, but it's this new stuff when it hits you is great. So, anyways, high recommend on the Beckham documentary. Um, right. Coastline. All right. I think that's all I have. Uh, as far as I did see a couple of interesting tidbits from Liv. I saw Chase Kepka uh, relegated from Liv. And then I saw um, I saw something I didn't really realize that it said Matt Wolf, Pat Perez, Charles, Schwartzel, and Graham McDowell were among the players who finished in Liv's open zone, numbers 25 through 44. They faced potential trade or release by their teams. Liv said earlier this year that it expected four to eight players from this group to not have a team to play for for 2024. I didn't really, I wasn't deep enough in the weeds to like realize that that was happening. That I could get behind. When I read that, I was like, that's fucking interesting. Like if you on the year long points list out of the 13 events don't finish high enough, you're basically unprotected. And if somebody doesn't pick you up, it is like Formula One where like if you don't have a car to drive, your career's over. That's that's the vision. And then there was also the OWGR saying that there's not promotion relegation, but it sounds like some guys are losing their card. And it's let's also not lack like there's a lot of guys in the PJ Tour who haven't been playing well, but because they've accomplished things in the past in golf, they like keep their card or they keep getting into events. So but I agree. I agree. I think the tra- the trading aspect and the free agency has been something that they've been, you know, kind of fantasizing about. We'll see if it actually becomes reality. Yeah. Because their whole right, like and I get you know, people be like, well, on the tour, you can lose your card, but you go down to Corn Ferry Tour or whatever. This was kind of pitched. It felt like it's like these guys sign these deals and it's guaranteed money, baby. It's like you're the starting quarterback for the New York Giants. It doesn't matter what happens. You're guaranteed, you know, whatever. And it's like, dude, now I'm I, my friend Graham McDowell, like he's not going to have, he potentially, nobody picks him up. He's going to have nowhere to play next year. That's fucking crazy. Like, where I got paid a lot. Yeah. Right. He's like, agent, baby. Ostracized and like he can't really play. You know, that's. You know, it, it's interesting. It kind of that piqued my interest a little bit. Um, and then on the live front, you know, that's a little teaser. We got Alan Ship now. Could we talk about all of it? A lot of things that have occurred. So uh, that's all I got from us. Enjoy this lengthy chat, but we could have talked for hours and hours and hours with Alan Shipnuck from the Fire Pit Collective and the author of Live and Let Die. Uh, hit it hard. Hit it hard. Hit it hard. Did you know that Barstool has its own, I guess I would say, like, um, hygiene bathroom product line? They got face wash. They got that, uh, I don't know what you call it, the other face stuff that's like it like exfoliates your face. The you know charcoal? charcoal? Yeah, that, it, it's not the charcoal one. It's like, I use it in the shower. It's got like a little bit grainy kind mm-hmm. of. Exfoliating um, wash. That stuff is fantastic, and they've got a whole line. So Barstool worked with, a handful of years ago, um, one of the top folks in the body, hair, face, beard products game to create a line um, made of all natural ingredients, uh, specially formulated to make you smell, look, etc., like a better man, uh, and came out with this product line called Wood, W-O-U-L-D, you can get it at CVS. You can get it um, at all kinds of different places, local Walmart. You can shop Woods Hair and Body Assortment today. It's time to smell like a better man. But I, I legitimately, every few months, go and buy almost this full line. I've got the shampoo. I got the conditioner. I got the body wash. I got the face wash. I got the exfoliation cream stuff. It really makes a big difference. It really does. And um, you see the difference when you use it. You know, I, I remember when I started using it, it's like, oh my God, I never thought that my face would feel this smooth and clean and you're not getting any pimples. You're not getting breaking out. You have to take care of it. Your skin is an organ. People forget that, right? It is an organ. It is an organ. It's an organ. Uh, you, got, you, got, you only get one of it. You only get one, one organ of skin and you got to make sure that you keep that nice and tight and clean and smelling good because it's nasty once that thing starts to turn south. <laughs> it could be get away from you really, really quickly. Uh, okay, check out the uh, natural products aisle at your local Walmart shop. Woods Hair and Body Assortment today. It's time to smell like a better man. All right, folks, uh, we're joined for the umpteenth time, at least the second, because a year and a half or so ago, when the Phil book came out, we did a fantastic chat for like an hour range side uh, at the PGA Championship Southern Hills last year. Alan Shipnuck, who's got the new book, 
Live and Let Die. It is the inside story of the war between the PGA Tour and Live Golf. I feel like the Tonight Show host when they do that. They used to always, when I would like, we would always I know, watch I love Jay Leno. It. It's great. Yeah, and they always, always have the book. It's a fa- I was looking at the artwork, the little skull golf course bunker thing. Who, where'd that come from? That's fantastic. Yeah. The, um, all credit to this designer who worked for Simon Schuster. You know, we had a little philosophical chat. I was like, it just needs something that's got a little wit, you know, like just to let us in. And this guy dreamed it up. I, I had two little touches that I will claim, you know, in the eyeballs, there's those little dollar signs that look like they were raked in there. And then, yep. um, if you look in the pond, there's a very small little shark fin that's our, our nod to Greg Norman. Oh, <laughs> nice work, that's good. Very small. That's a very, nice very subtle. I wanted that. most people haven't even noticed that before. So, um, yeah, it's, you know, the, the title, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's a little hyperbolic, but you know, it's a McCartney song. It's a bond movie. It's got a little cachet. So, it, I mean, this is a big, serious story, but uh, you know, my, I try and keep it, I try and have a little fun along the way. And, uh, so I, th- I think the, the artwork and the, the cover and the title kind of captured it. Well, I devoured the book. Um, I finished it last night. Um, I, you're an incredible writer, just an incredible writer. I think you could write, very good you could writer. write the, very good writer. you could write the crap out of me getting on the subway. Um, you know, it's just, just the adjective use. I'm, I'm in awe of your adjectives. Um, <laughs> I wanted to ask you about the process of reporting this book versus you know, I think you've written five or six other books, maybe even more than that. I don't want to, I don't want to under, you know, underplay your, your record as an author, but this is obviously a book that takes on more in terms of geopolitics. Uh, this is kind of the hairiest story that you've reported. So, so what was the process like for, for compiling everything for this book versus the ones you've worked on in the past? Yeah, this was a monster because you have this huge cast of characters. You know, obviously every player who's mattered over the last 30 years, including Tiger and Phil, uh, but you've got Rory and Bryson and Brooks and DJ and, and Justin and Jordan. Uh, and then you have, you have the box office of Donald Trump. You have Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia. You know, his excellency Yashir al-Rumayn, who every golf fan's gotten to know. And then you've got these giant themes of that transcend sports you know it's about it's about greed and it's about friendship and betrayal and and legacy and all of this stuff so and of course it was playing out in real time i mean i was reporting it as i was writing it and things were constantly evolving so i mean it was a motherfucker but i i was also so much fun like you know, I felt like this is a once in a lifetime story because of this, this cocktail of, of, of the protagonists, of the themes, of the geopolitics. And I mean, certainly the biggest golf story this century doesn't involve the guy on your sweater, Riggs, Tiger Woods. And so it's actually not him. It's actually just yeah, a tiger. Yeah, I just want to make just, that clear. Oh, okay. Last yeah, year, Alan was the, the year of the tiger. So it just, uh, ironically enough, we, yeah. <laughs> Memo to so, Mark Steinberg. And yeah, others. exactly. That's right. We're trying to get sued here. <laughs> right. When yeah. Kevin Hopkins is listening. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't mean to wait in yeah. something so No, no, so it's, it's your opinion, but that's, you know, it's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, I was just carried away um, by the energy of this. I mean, Golf is, as you guys know, is a very boring, staid sport. But all of a sudden, it just exploded, and the the bitchiness and the the name calling and the tribal aspects, and that's just in the golf media, let alone the players. Like you know, <laughs> um, it was it was um, it was fun. I mean, my son at one point, you know, he's he's a, he's a sweet kid. He's he's he was fourteen. And I was pretty much working seven days a week, usually till midnight. And he came, he sat in my lap. He's like, I'm so sorry you have to work so hard, dad. I was like, are you kidding me, man? I'm having a blast. Like, mm-hmm. read this quote from Paul Casey. Like, it's unbelievable. You know, like whatever, you know, there's just like, um, there was, there's just so much life in this story. And my editor at one point, when it was done, he's like, I'm not mad, but are you aware that the word fuck appears 62 times in this book? I said, um, I was you know, I was going for a hundred, but I'm a little disappointed. I let well, you Well, like down. five yeah, of those right, are just Paul right. Casey just swearing at Jamie Weir. So, you <laughs> know, those, those, yeah. aren't, those aren't really in your words. No, no. I mean, generally, there's other, I'm just quoting people, but because everyone was so passionate and so emotional and so invested in this. And, you know, I think the book captures that energy. Um, you know, reputations were destroyed and lives were altered and, and legacies were, were forever changed. I mean, there was a lot going on in this story. So that, that energy carried me along. I, I find too, you know, I, we spoke about this story 
so often and that just the larger story of live golf the existential threat to the pga tour and and you know it got to the point right like all of a sudden we my, myself dan we're getting media requests to go on cnbc or cnn and that you know you know the yeah. story is transcending golf at that point with the with the animosity that came out and the quotes and people suing other people and then, you know, players weighing in on their thoughts on Phil Mickelson all the way up to Rory weighing in on his legitimate, like, thoughts about Phil Mickelson as a person and then the Brooks Kepko and the quote, like, did, did you, as someone in golf media for, you know, many, many years, did you feel like a lot of that came from undercurrents that already existed, like, you know, like... To me, it right. It, it's golf is so. He's a gentleman. You take off your hat and you shake his hand. You never root against your opponent. And there's a lot of <laughs> bullshit to that because none right. of you know. Like if you're a competitor, you're playing for. It feels to me when you when I read a lot of the excerpts from the book, a lot of the fiery quotes that come out. When I take myself back in time over the last you know 18 months of all of this, it feels like as people that are pretty close to the game that there are a lot of undercurrents of opinions differing opinions that wouldn't be popular in the media that kind of came to light because of this rift one million percent it live it became a mirror you know it became this this um this x-ray machine of the soul for a lot of these guys and it allowed them to say the things they've always wanted to say and you know even even like on some level, this is just Tiger against Phil all over again. You know, it's this perpetuation of this, this 30 year rivalry and, um, you know, each, each guy fighting for what they believe in. And they're, you know, Tiger who's, he jumps on the jet and rallies the troops and he's this inspirational figure, you know, fills this in the back alleys, this shadowy deal maker, you know, all this subterfuge. And it's like, it's just perfect. And, um, so yeah, the, you know, the bubbling resentments, like, you know, the Rory who's been celebrated as, as the statesman of the game for his advocacy for the PGA tour, the guys on live hate Rory because he took so many personal shots at them. And, you know, they, they really feel like he's taken the money too. It just came from the PGA tour. You know, he has, he's embedded in, in the, in the tour financials. He has all these revenue streams that the tour has, has driven to him. So is he really so pure of heart that he's fighting for these ideals or is this about protecting his, his business interests? You know, it's probably both and there's nothing wrong with that, but you know, that there there's, as you say, Riggs, like it just exposed a lot of these fissures in the game that have been covered up and, you know, between the European tour and the PGA tour, um, between the commissioner and the tour leadership amongst the players, like there was, a, there was a lot of things that have been patched over and sort of held together, tenuously and live exploded all of that and that's why it was such a juicy story because it just revealed so much about so many going back to the beginning of the whole thing you know your book you obviously you, you play you know you, you explain the thinking from both sides but i could tell that that you kind of felt like the pga tour uh took a misstep when they didn't take the meeting initially is that what set off this whole thing? Was this really avoidable? Was there really a way in which the Saudis were going to come and Jay Monahan was going to say, oh, yes, sir. Great. Give us your money. We'll cut you a deal. Or, or were the, the cast of characters and, and, you know, the gulf, no pun intended, too wide between the two parties? Nice. It, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, you have to go back to the Premier Golf League, which it was fun to, to bring that to life because – I honestly, the Premier Golf League had been knocking around for so many years, I stopped paying attention to it. And I didn't fully understand what was happening behind the scenes in real time. And I mean, it became public in 2018. It had been it had been happening since well before that. I mean, in some ways, like this book is the biography of an idea. It's one guy, this London lawyer, Andy Gardner, sitting in you know his leather chair at home with a yellow legal tablet, writing ideas as just an obsessive golf fan. Like, how can we make the sport better? You guys watch a lot of golf. Like we all know the product is a little bloated. It's a little tired. It needs refreshing. Like he recognized Definitely. that. And he was, you know, he's a, he's a London lawyer. He's pretty well connected. He started talking to stakeholders in the game. One was Rory McIlroy. One was Keith Pelly, who runs the European tour. And he eventually turned all his ideas into this prospectus. It was 116 pages, like painstakingly detailed on how to redo professional golf from its presentation to fans, between the ropes, everything. This one guy dreamed this all up, and then, uh, but he was dogged and he was smart. And they got all the got, way to a Twitter account. There was a tweet, wasn't there? 
Yeah, yeah. yeah they eventually those. they eventually went public. Um, in, and but he got Rain Capital to pledge five hundred million dollars. It was the PGL that brought in the Saudis as investors for five hundred million dollars. But Andy Gardner was an idealist. He was not a closer. He couldn't get it done. And that's a theme that runs through this book. Like the idealists, they keep getting their hearts ripped out, including Roy McElroy. You could even say Greg Norman, you know, his world tour idea. Like he had a he had a dream and a vision. And then he met Tim Fincham, who was a relentless boardroom warrior, and, and he destroyed Norman's reputation forever. And so um Andy Gardner couldn't get it done. The Saudis lost faith in him, and they said, you know what? let's just cut and paste this idea and, ma and make a go of it ourselves. And so they broke from the PGL, they took their money and they decided they were going to try and create their own league. But before there was any traction or any momentum, their number two guy, the Majed Al Saror sends his letter to Jay Monahan. And this letter's never been public before. Well, it the letter, as you describe it in the book was on like a fucking piece of printer paper. I'd be freaked out as well. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's part of what makes it great. It's so ambiguous. Like, um, but Monaghan knew who Majed was because he was a CEO of Golf Saudi. He'd been part of the golf world for years. He knew how much money he was sitting on, who his boss was. Like, this is not a mystery, but the lack of protocol gave Monaghan enough wiggle room. And so, but yeah, if Jay Monaghan, and this letter said, we want to invest in golf, we want to partner with the tour, and we want to see if we can do this together. But there was a little threat baked into it. But if not, we're probably going to do it on our own. Like, it's kind of like, you know, jump, you're going to get pushed. So to your point, Dan, like there was, there was, it was edgy, but still, if Jay Monahan had a time machine, I have no doubt he would go back to April of 2021 when that letter lands with a thud on his desk and he would meet with Majed and bring the Saudis in and co-op them, take their money, lessen their influence because they did not have the hammer yet. They did not have live golf, but they just had this idea, but they had no players committed. And um, he could have headed it off at the pass. But, you know, Monaghan, as people know, is this college hockey player. He's this pugnacious Boston dude. And around the tour headquarters, he has a nickname for like the dark side of his personality is Hockey J. And that's how he responded to it. He's like, basically, fuck these guys. And he goes into this board, this board meeting and Charlie Hoffman, one of the player directors says, why are we not talking to these Saudi guys? And Monaghan says, we are at war. Like they were trying to take over our business. We are at war. And that kicked off this whole era of division and strife and antagonism. And so part of that, I think, was pride. Part of it was fear. Part of it was, you know, the PJ Tour has always been this insular little world that's impenetrable from the outside. And so it's a crucial misstep. Now, maybe they could not have consummated a deal, but don't you have a fiduciary duty to at least try. I mean, if, um, you know, if, if some company or some entity you guys don't really like, like sent, sent you an email, said, Hey, we want to put a hundred million dollars into the four play podcast. Can we have a conversation about it? You would probably make the phone call. You might not come yep. to, you might not close the deal, but don't you have to listen? Like it's insane. So you have to, and you know, and look, we, in the in the years that we've spoken about this entire thing, right? It, it, people could understand that Monahan and the tour, if you're up against essentially unlimited money, you have very little leverage. The cards that they did play were the morality cards and the infamous now 9-11 comments on the broadcast that Monahan made. And what people didn't realize, what I didn't realize in that in that time as we were making all those comments was that they had this opportunity early on and what you would what you would like to see for the leadership of a massive entity like the pga tour that's got so much cultural influence financial influence that's been around for for decades and decades and these guys that are in charge of it that get paid millions and millions of dollars they should have the foresight to see the landscape, to understand what this threat could be and not have shut that down so much and understand better the landscape and the very real possibility that if you shut this down and you go full hockey J mode, you very realistically might find yourself in two years with your tail between your legs in a, in a emasculating interview sitting beside I'll remind, which is exactly what happened. And so I think that, right, like a lot of people say, I, I have no issue with commissioners and, and these, these heads of these leagues getting paid a ton of money when that league continues to succeed and continues to make more and more money and get bigger and bigger and be more and more successful. They earn it. 
my issue with that is like clearly they didn't fucking earn it in those crucial moments and decisions because they ended up taking what I think everybody agrees is a way worse deal and ended up giving, you know, as you kind of describe a lot in the book, like uh, Yasser al Ramayan is now one of, if not the most powerful person in the world of golf, which they allowed to happen on their watch. Exactly. And it, it runs even deeper because the tour is supposed to be a membership organization. I mean, Monaghan is mere, it's right. not his tour. He's not, he's just a caretaker. He's supposed to be protecting the interests of the players. And he didn't even bring the players into the d- decision making. Like they never got to meet with Andy Gardner, even though Andy Gardner kept trying to have these dialogues, trying to forge a compromise between the PGL and the PGA tour. He never, Monahan never even took, um, that letter to the full board of directors. It was just like, these are bad guys. We're not going to deal with them. And that's it. And it, you know, there was a breakdown amongst the the players on the board. They didn't fight hard enough. Like they didn't use the voice that they had or the platform they had. They just kind of accepted it. And, you know, I talked to Kevin Kisner and I talked to James Hahn, who were, they were, there were two of the four guys on the board in that time. And they just said, we, you know, we trusted Jay's leadership and, and Jay sets the agenda for the tour. And we went along with it. It's like, you were elected to fight for your peers. And so they kind of, they, they were not strong enough advocates for themselves, but um, yeah, it, it's, it's even worse when you realize that the players had no say and that, that Monaghan unilaterally decided without any support, no, no vote from the board, really no input. One man decided that we're not going to have these conversations and we're going to charge forward. And that's where you open yourself up to massive second guessing. One of the things I've tried to, 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 stress that is the difference between professional golf as a, as a blanket term and the PGA tour. And they're not the same thing. Yeah. And the PGA tour doesn't control or own the five most valuable tournaments in the sport. Um, how much in obviously the majors in the Ryder cup, how much was their position weakened? Because at the end of the day, I had a lot of people saying, Oh, well, professionally they have the masters, they have this, but they really don't. So what did the PGA tour have or, or what sort of um, I guess, um, what's the word I'm looking for? What kind of uh, weaknesses did they have that the, that the Saudis were able to exploit? Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, the um, what the tour has is provenance, right? Like they have these all these great old tournaments, and they have tradition and they have prestige. But one of the things that Monahan overrated was what that meant to the players, because you know, like. Phil Mickelson, you know, at Pebble Beach, his grandfather was a caddy when Pebble Beach opened and he was given a silver dollar for doing the 36 hole loop. And he carried it, Al Santos carried it in his pocket for decades and rubbed it clean. You couldn't even see the markings anymore. It was this, it was this promise of a better life. And it was like his good luck charm. He gave it to his grandson who uses it as ball marker during the tournament that he's won five times. Like Phil is Mr. Pebble Beach and everyone, he talks about all the dinner parties he goes to and he <laughs> loves that tournament so much. And Amy loves to go there to shop and all this stuff. And the second the Saudis started a tournament, started paying him to go over there. He's like, see a pebble. I'm out. Like the, the players are just not romantics the way that some of the rest of us are. And a PGA tour event in Phoenix feels a lot like a live event in Tucson to them. It's a chance to build a brand, to make money and try and get sharp for the majors. If, if you're in the majors. And so it's been a little, disenchanting for golf fans, but obviously for Jay Monahan too, that the value of a PJ tour card is not what he thought it was to a lot of his players. So that that's part of the the structural weakness you're talking about there, Dan, is like they overrated what the PJ tour meant. Now to Tiger, it means a lot. It's his legacy. You know, for a guy like John Rahm, like it, it's still value. It has value to some players who see the world differently, but the definition of a professional golfer is you play golf for money. and Right. It's like those are like five guys a generation who it actually matters how many PJ Tour events they win. Yeah. And they stayed. They stayed home. But the other guys are like, just give me the money and let's play golf. You know, and that's what I do. So that was something that was working against Monaghan for sure. And But again, that was a tactical error on his part. Like, you know, have you ever had to apologize for, for being a PGA Tour member? You know, he turned it into this moralistic argument. He made it about legacy. And his players were not buying what he was selling. No, clearly not. (laughs) Clearly not. Uh, You know, the, so the book starts, the forward starts with a, a a very ominous tale of this meeting. I believe it was in 1994 uh, that Greg Norman sort of puts together. And 
Uh, he gives his kind of quick spiel about how these guys can play for so much more money, 40 something person field around the world, eight events, and essentially gets thwarted immediately. Arnold Palmer stands up and basically says, you know, nope, PJ Tour has been, you know, great for me. This isn't worth it. See you later. Everybody stands up, leaves. Norman's left emasculated. You kind of end all of that by saying, you know, essentially that vengeance is a key play in this entire thing, too. You know, how, how, how underlying has all of this over the last 30 years now? How much is vengeance and Greg Norman's sort of personal feelings and being heard and, and being kind of looked like an asshole in front of his colleagues and stuff? How much did that factor in? A lot. And yeah, I, you know, 1994 is my first year on the golf beat. I was an intern at Sports Illustrated. And so, Heroes born. Yeah. Wow. Brutal. Uh, I'm going to get some just for men for my beard as soon as we get off this <laughs> podcast. And, um, but so I was aware that was happening, but it was way over my head, you know, and it was really fun to go back and recreate that moment and talk to a lot of the guys who were in that room, um, you know, whether it was Azinger or, Faxon or um, Jacobson or, you know, Lanny Watkins, like these great old warriors. And that, that, that whole thing just crackles with tension. And, and here you have Arnie Palmer, he's 65 years old. He only plays a few events a year and he, he begrudgingly goes to this meeting and Norman lays out this whole vision for how golf's going to change and evolve. And Arnie's sitting there like, are you fucking kidding me? And um, <laughs> he's like, and he says to Greg, he says, you ever heard of the big three? You know, how many times do you think people came to us to do our own thing? And we always said no because it was bad for the game. It was bad for the fellas, which I love that. And then Arnie gets up and walks out. Like, how macho is that? I mean, I can just picture him just strutting out of there with like these, you know, six shooters strapped on each hip. And, um, and, uh, and then all the players follow Arnie out basically. And yeah, Norman is left there humiliated and seething. Um, and then Tim Fincham very quickly steals his idea, creates a world golf championships. And there's another moment in the book where, you know, Norman hears about this. It's the president's cup and he runs up to Fincham and he's like, how long have you been planning this? And, 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 and Fincham's like, oh, about a month. And Norman's like, fuck you. <laughs> like, he, like, he just loses it. It's a great little moment. And, and Norman has been a pariah ever since because he, he tried to, to, to rage against the machine. He tried to change the system, but he did it unilaterally. He didn't get the other players to buy into it. And it, it sent him down this path where, you know, he's never been accepted as a grand old man of the game. And he's always been an outsider. And that has burned at him because people forget how great a player he was and how much he did spread the gospel of golf all around the world. And he did help make it a global game and he, he should be celebrated as a pioneer and, you know, the great white shark, like he invented modern marketing for golfers and, and this idea that they could be these multinational corporations. Like he changed the game, but instead he's remembered as a traitor and a failure. And that has burned at his soul for all of these years. And when he, when the Saudis came into golf, they were mesmerized by his star power and Norman courted them hard. And he, it wasn't like the Saudis had this idea and they brought Norman along to be the figurehead. Like he germinated it. He planted the seed, he nurtured it. And so it was his ultimate middle finger to the PGA tour, to the golf establishment, to all the naysayers. Like he finally was this agent of change he had always wanted to be. And so it's an incredible tale. And it goes back to that one moment in this wine room at Sherwood Country Club in 1994. And um, so to, to pull on all these threads and to bring all these stories together to, to give, you know, readers and fans like the context of, I mean, I trace the, the history of, of the, the PJ Tour breaking away from the PJ America in 1968. You know, that was also born of rebellion. And that, that time it was Arnie who was the guy who, who was the agent of chaos, who changed everything along with Jack Nicholas. And so it's ironic that now he shoots down Norman to be the voice of the establishment. And, um, you know, you just, you have to understand these historical precedents to really figure out how we got to this crazy moment in time. I've had this debate with a number of people because it seems like, you know, one of the consistent messages from Rory and from Tiger is, you know, as long as, is, if Greg leaves, then we can, we can make a deal. You know, Greg is a, is a roadblock. Obviously, his his personal motivations are a huge reason that this got off the ground. But he also 
was a bit of a gaff, you know, in in public and and saying things about you know Saudis that just got terrible headlines. So was Greg Norman an asset or a liability for Live Golf over the last couple of years? Both. I mean, he he's a charismatic guy. He helped in the recruitment of a lot of players and the next generation who didn't really live through that, you know, the younger guys, I think they recognized that Norman was a, they did see him as kind of this pioneer. He came to this little Island in the middle of nowhere and he did change the game. And I think they have a certain respect for him that his contemporaries don't because they didn't have to deal with his abrasive ego and, and this sense of betrayal with the world tour. Um, big picture. He's probably more of a liability because, you know, there's a, I interviewed Dean Beeman, who was you know, the most impactful PJ Tour commissioner um, in creating the modern tour. He's now in his 80s, but he's still fiery as hell. And, you know, he said the Saudis making Greg Norman, the head of Live Golf, w- was an act of war. <laughs> like, you know, there was a strong quote because because Norman has been this pariah. And it, it speaks a little bit to the naivete or the cluelessness of the Saudis uh, particularly Al Rumayan and, and Majed Al Saroor, like they wanted desperately to be part of the ecosystem. Here's this Hall of Fame golfer, this charismatic dude, and he just kind of swept them off their feet. But if obviously they would have been much better served by having someone else out front because Norman has a unique ability to say the wrong thing, and just his very presence is so polarizing. Like if imagine if they'd hired Nick Price and said you know, instead of Greg Norman, this is another international player, but who everyone loves and who, who's just understated and soft-spoken, like the whole tenor would have changed. But Norman loves, he loves confrontation. He loves controversy. He loves being the center of attention. And it's, it helped create buzz around live. And it, it, that's how live golf crossed out of the, the sports page onto the business page, onto the front page. You know, Norman helped drive that because of, because of his, in, his incredible charisma and this, uh, the fact he's been a brand name for decades. But um, if, if live, if the whole point was to become part of the golf establishment and to be accepted by the world ranking, by the PGA tour, by corporate America, Norman was a bad choice. I, yeah, I do have to admit like we, at our old barstool headquarters, we, oh, I uh, this. you know, we had him on the show uh, like maybe five or six years ago. It's been now, which seems crazy, but I mean, he was excellent. He was a fantastic guest, sat there with for an hour. He, he answered everything. He told all kinds of stories, the Bill Clinton story, the whole deal. But, you know, we had – when you came off the elevator, you couldn't, you couldn't avoid – it was like you literally exit the elevator. There wasn't even really a reception, and you were just in, like, the blogger area. And we were a much smaller company, and so you just could – you noticed everybody that came off. We had so many people come through there, and very few, maybe a handful that you could kind of point to of, like, I don't know what it is, but that person has star power. And Greg Norman was one of those people. It was like when he was there, you know, the young women that do different podcasts that have no idea who Greg Norman is, don't follow golf. People that just don't, they just, you could just sense, you could look and be like, I don't know who the fuck that guy is, but that guy is just a star. The way he carried himself, the way he looks, like you said, his charisma, he does have that when he, when he's in a room, like that guy is just, he's, he's just kind of a star. Yeah, no question. And, um, that's, and he, he went on that charm offensive with the Saudis because Norman is very calculating and uh, he was aware of what was happening with the PGL and it's, and it, it was its demise. And he, he saw the opportunity. These guys want to get into golf. They have all the money. Um, I can help get them where they want to go. And when, yeah, when he puts the, you know, he's kind of like the guy in American Psycho. Like when he puts the full court press on you, like you, you're dazzled, right? But, you know, then, yeah. then he gets you back to the the apartment. He starts chopping you up with a chainsaw. Like it's not a good outcome, right. but like he's, no. he does have that, that, that it factor you're talking about. And it certainly is how, how he seduced the, the top Saudi guys to, to go all in. And, um, you know, you have, at the same time, you have to give Greg Norman credit because He's nurtured this idea and he has undeniably changed golf. And he's him and Phil are philosophically, Phil Mickelson are philosophically aligned on a lot of things. And he's always, Norman's always felt the players should get paid more and they should have more say in their governance. And both of those things are going to happen because of live golf. And he's been the driving force. So he's going to declare victory no matter what happens and, and say, we did it. We changed golf. We've given the players a voice. We've given them a platform. We've, we've, recalibrated the marketplace so they can get their true worth. And he's going to, he's going to declare total victory. It's a little more nuanced than that, but 
uh, in some ways, he's right. I'm sure we're going to get into uh, the you know the kind of public kerfuffle with Justin Thomas and and some of those guys in a bit. Before before we do that, I want to ask you about. There's two anecdotes um, that are kind of un, not unrelated, but as you mentioned, you know you, you can't tell the story without giving a lot of color and a lot of detail about just what was happening in the world of golf and a little bit of background on all these people. So there are a, a bunch of entertaining little diatribes that are not necessarily directly related to live in the PGA Tour. So the first one I have is why didn't uh, Donald Trump get into Seminole Golf Club. <laughs> yeah, uh, the legendary story is that he he took uh, Marla Maples his um, his bride and she was that had, had an infant child and she started breastfeeding. I guess that's Tiffany, right? I don't know the Trump genealogy. Yeah, I think that's Tiffany, right? And started breastfeeding at the table in the grill room at Seminole, and you know, it's just not the kind of thing you would see at a swell place like that. <laughs> and it just, it just spoke to the, you know, they're kind of like this gauche new money crew. And that's not the profile of the Seminole member. So um, that it's, it's a funny tale, but it, it's also germane because this whole golf empire that, that, that Trump has built is because he's always been an outsider. He's been this, this outer borough striver from Queens who was desperate to be accepted by high society in Manhattan. And, you know, you can you can buy the biggest house in Palm Beach, which is Mar-a-Lago, but you still can't get into Seminole, just like you can't get into Augusta or Shinnecock or Pine Valley or Marion. None of these like citadels will let Donald Trump on the property. So he turns around, has to build his own courses and create his own golf empire and, you know, replete with waterfalls and all this stuff that is kind of his aesthetic. And but why does this matter? Because those are the courses that are hosting live golf events now because Trump gets, he gets completely exiled by the PGA tour, the PGA of America, the USGA and the RNA. Everybody in the men's game has told Donald Trump to get lost. The only place where he can get any purchase, where he can have any, any platform is live golf. And so, and meanwhile, live is desperate for venues because it's so polarizing most courses and clubs don't want them. And so they create this, this, this shotgun marriage of having these live events at these Trump courses. It served both of their purposes and especially Trump's, but it became very problematic for live when the first event at Bedminster turned into this MAGA rally and Trump invites Tucker Carlson, Marjorie Taylor Greene, like two of the most polarizing people in American life and they're chanting anti-Biden slogans, and it just became a mess. And for Liv, like every sports league, they're trying to make money and they're trying to sell sponsorships. And big companies don't want controversy. Uh, they don't want to get sucked into an ugly political thing. So the, nope. the Liv Trump nexus was very damaging for Liv Golf, um, but it also as Liv was struggling to be taken seriously by the golf press and in the media in general, because of Trump's involvement, the Fox news outkicked the coverage. Some of these more right-leaning uh, organizations, media organizations became very friendly audiences. So, and you know, Ari Fleischer, who's a live consultant is also a contributor to Fox news. So that's how they got on national airwaves. All these interviews you saw with Bryson and with Norman, and some others, it was always Fox News. And it's just an interesting part of the tale. So unwinding Trump's influence um, becomes part of this tale. And it, if you even go further back, like I have, a, I have a whole chapter on the history of Saudi Arabia, which might be too much for some readers, but it's so fundamental because why are the Saudis spending billions of dollars on mere golfers to sports wash their image? I mean, you have to start with the road to 9-11, the rise of MBS, the killing of Jamal Khashoggi. And what, what kept MBS in power to a large degree after Khashoggi was Donald Trump being in the Oval Office. And he was his staunchest ally. And now Live Golf is paying Trump millions of dollars to host these tournaments. Like this is this is a story that's less about golf than it's about like money, power, and politics. And Trump, like Mickelson's in, in the middle of everything on the golf side, Trump's in the middle of everything when, when you get to these these other you know spokes in the story. So the, it's a long way of saying that she was breastfeeding at Seminole. Um, <laughs> the, the other, right. the other, so it's like, the sir, other, this is uh, the Wendy's drive-in. <laughs> yeah, the other, uh, the other one McDonald's, I wanted to ask, and I, I, I read this. I read this a couple times because it kind of stopped me in my tracks. 
Your book seems to suggest that Tiger Woods crashed his vehicle on purpose. I wouldn't say on purpose. I think it says something dark came over Woods' soul. And then you say that he couldn't have had his foot on the pedal if he fell asleep or was looking at his phone. Right. So, you know, Tiger's always batted away questions about what happened that day by saying it's all in the police report. And I've read the police report. And this was a twisty residential road, speed limit of 40 miles an hour. Tiger was driving in the mid to high 80s, which is crazy. I mean, I, I drove that stretch of road to see it. I mean, you go, you go 47, you feel like you're, you're, you're on. I've a, been there. It's like a thing in Los Angeles. People go there to drive fast cars. It's like one of those. It's a crazy it's, road. Yeah, it's a crazy road. Um, in the police report, it says that throughout this accident, the pedal was depressed 99%. Basically, he was flooring it even as he lost control of the vehicle. So yeah, people said, oh, you know, he fell asleep at the wheel. It was early. Maybe he took some pain meds. Like if you're asleep, you're not smashing the gas. If you're distracted by your phone, you're probably not smashing the gas. So what was happening there? Like, I feel like only Tiger's ever going to know definitively, but it, it honestly, it reminded me of you know, you know, Junior Seau from the Chargers, a great linebacker, Hall of Famer. And he had a single car accident and that set off all kinds of alarm bells with his friends and family because the story didn't check out. And then not that long after junior Seau took his life and it was a lot of people close to him have said like, I, when that accident happened, I knew that was some sort of like cry for help and that he had, he had sort of lost control of his life. So I think there's, there's some overtones to, there's just no explanation. You know, tigers in his rental car, um, going to do a magazine shoot like i was there i was at the shoot yeah you were waiting like yeah so yeah some something happened to tiger i don't know what exactly what it is but it doesn't feel like it was a healthy moment in his life and but this again where why does why does this matter in the context of this story because that day ended tiger's career as a week in week out force in golf now, hopefully he can summon some more magic and, and give us another thrill or two, but he's never going to play more than a few events a year now. That's becoming obvious. And so what is what does he have in his life? How can he fill that void? Well, this battle for the soul of professional golf animated Tiger. It gave him a purpose. It, it brought him back in into this fold and it gave him a chance to connect with this whole other generation of players. Like... You know, I, I had fun recreating when Tiger flies to Delaware to host that meeting, which is a crucial moment in this story. Like the PGA Tour had been on the defensive this whole time. This was the first time they played offense and the players got together. They talked about a strategy. That's what led to the elevated events. It was a way to funnel money to the players to keep them loyal to the tour. Tiger did not have to get on the plane to rally the troops for a bunch of tournaments he's never going to play in. Right. But he he thought he was fighting for something larger than himself. And, you know, Will Zalatoris told me this funny story Like he walks in the room and there's Tiger and he's coming out of this this playoff at Memphis where Zalatoris won. But he did this kind of this, this risky shot on this part three and Tiger's like talking trash to him. And like that meant so much to Will Zalatoris because Tiger's been this remote figure to these younger guys forever because he just hasn't been out on tour. He's been hurt, everything else. And so to connect to these players, to, to give his life meaning, to to have this connection that he desperately needed after this, this horrific accident, like, like live golf gave tiger a purpose. And, um, it was, it was to fight for the tour to fight for his legacy. Because if, if all the players go to live, um, the value of a PGA tour win is badly devalued and tiger's fighting for his legacy. You know, he's very prideful of his achievements as he should be. And 82 wins is the gold standard on the PGA tour. And he has a piece of that. And he doesn't want the tour to wither and he doesn't want it to become B-list. And so uh, there's a, a element of selfishness, but, you know, and of course he's been, he's been collecting all the pit money, even though he's not even playing competitive golf, but he did not have to take on this fight, but he did. And it meant so much to all the other guys loyal to the tour. Yeah. I, uh, the tiger stuff and the, the, the kind of evolution of him into this phase, I think is, is for like, us that are tiger diehards it's actually really really nice to see because i think it would have been m more believable when he was in his dominance that this guy's going to win as much as he possibly going to win and then with all the navy seal stuff and all that it's like one day he's just going to disappear he doesn't give a shit about this like if he's if he's so 
you know, committed to trying other stuff and being basically bored at this point that he's probably going to uh, uh, eventually just check out and be like, see you later. So for him to kind of in the second phase of his life, be so invested in Charlie's game in the future of the tour, all that. It, it's obviously great for people that are fans, but I, like you said, I think it clearly has a huge impact on those players where like if Tiger Woods walks into a room and basically tells you that this is really important, this is where you should be playing. If you're Wills Alatoris or Max Homer, a lot of these guys, that's clearly, clearly going to affect you. So I think the relevance to the story and all that is, um, yeah, is very clear. I'm, uh, you know, glad you included it. I would say, uh, let's get into the, the player stuff. Obviously Tiger Woods, one of his good friends, Justin Thomas, the comments, I think the, the general sentiment about it is pretty obvious. Like, uh, clearly in, in, uh, in journalism, you're not there just to report fluff pieces. Everybody knows that. What I would like to get into is sort of your reaction to some of the parts of like JT's tweets that I thought were a little more stingy, where he essentially says, you know, one of his lines is, uh, uh, earning zero trust with a lot of incorrect information. Another thing he says is there's many media members who I respect that tell all sides, but go about it correctly. How, how do you feel when he kind of challenges your accuracy and your legitimacy? Yeah. And you know, I, it's like, I, I'm on the West coast. I wake up and I check my phone. It's like, Whoa, you know, like, I, yeah, like <laughs> been uh, there. Good, good. Yeah. Good morning. Um, Same. Uh, so yeah, not, yeah. yeah, no, I, I noticed that too when I moved to Arizona and like we're three hours behind half the year. And yeah, if I wake up at like seven 30, it's 10 30. You've already two and a half, three hours of like things yeah. have happened and you could be going after you're like, Oh shit. What, what the hell? Yeah. I got <laughs> yeah, that. I know. So, yeah. It, there, it's a little disorienting and it's, it's obviously not, you know, on a human element, it doesn't feel great. I mean, the Thomas tweet was so revealing um, to me, you know, when he says all sides, what he means is his side, you know, that's, he wants his side told he wants these and he's saying, oh, I, why did I, I want to write more positive stuff. It's like the tour we all know coddles the players, protects them, doesn't release information about suspensions. Like they want, and Justin's not alone in this. The top players just want their official version to go out. And in the context of this live story, they've been spooned. In their defense, though, in their defense, I would say like almost everyone on earth probably wants that, right? Like I don't know a ton of people that are like, you know what? I but they seem to expect. I would it. really like to have like everyone's side, not just mine. Like I, you know, like that's I, fair. I get that's that fair. people might be but, more accepting of it, but I, I don't know anyone that's eager to be like, you know, it'd be much better if you were objective here and not just reporting stuff that makes <laughs> me look good. Yeah, that, that, that's well said, but. You know, in the context of the live story, they've been spoon fed all this stuff by by Jay Monahan and Jimmy Dunn. You know, we won the battle. Uh, we we control the board seats. We control the future of golf. Well, I, I've talked to a few businessmen. I don't know any company where one guy puts in all the money and has no influence. And that's kind yeah. of what Jay's been selling them as this vision. And I think they bought into that and they're realizing that's just not true. Um, just like. You know, they bought into this moralistic argument. These are bad guys and their money's dirty. And then, and then, and they, they paired to that and they, they believed it and they repeated it. And that, that became their whole worldview. And then in the end, it's like, oh, that's not, that's actually not true. They're good guys and we like their money. And so I think world that, class investor, world class like investor. World class, that's right. Sharp, sharp guys. Sharp world guy. class investor was the one that just cracked me up, man. He's up there <laughs> talking about 9 11. And then, we had that. I don't know if you were on that Zoom call. He had that Zoom call that he arranged, like private Zoom call with reporters I in was. his office. He he looked like a dead person, and yeah. he goes, he goes, we have an investor. And then you could tell that, like in his, it, like clicked in his head that he's actually agreed to call them a world class investor. Yeah. So he goes, we have an investor, a world class investor, and then he keeps going. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The so this whole story's been like a, an information war on some level. Like everyone spinning, everyone's trying to to influence uh, because so much of this stuff has happened in the shadows. Like when, when deals were done and contracts were made, there was no press release or press conference when money moved around, like it was all secret. And so the players have not fully known the story all along and they've been disoriented as things have changed. And so they're grasping for control of the story in a way that makes sense. And so I'm coming in and I'm offering some, some counter narratives and I'm challenging some assumptions. And for a guy like Justin, um, he doesn't want to hear that. He wants it to everything to be tidy in the way that it can, it conforms to his worldview. I love that he put in, in his tweet, I'm sick of Alan Shipnuck trying to make money 
like, Justin, you're going to make more money finishing dead last in a no cut elevated event than anyone on the golf beat's going to make. And especially from books where there's really not the money people think there is like, but these players become so greedy and so voracious. It's like, uh, you know, I write a book. I'm trying to put my kids through college, but I'm the bad guy. You know, it's like, it just didn't really track with reality. Um, but the, your, to your question a little more directly, Riggs, like I'm not here to do the player's bidding. I never have been. And so there's been hard feelings for 30 years because I feel like more important to me than the relationship with the players is the relationship I have with the readers and that they count on me to give it to them straight and to tell them what's really happening. And that's just always been my role in the game. And sometimes, you know, it, it, it affects your relationship with the players because as you said, they, they don't always want to hear the truth. And so um, the trust building is interesting. Uh, I had a, many players tell me so many things that was very delicate information. Like a lot of guys on tour put their trust in me to tell this story. So, you know, Justin's not one of them. Like we've always had this edgy relationship. Like he's not even really a figure in this book. I've hardly ever written about him because I don't find him that compelling. So i he can't say I've ever burned him because I've never dealt with him really. I just, I just give him a wide berth because uh, I just, I don't find anything about his life or career worth telling in, in, a, in, in my, from my perspective. So I just, he's, whatever he's, he, whatever his objections are, are second or third hand, like, um, so I don't, I don't know what, exactly what he's even referring to there, but, um, again, it's like, even when you talk about the Phil book, you know, Phil took some shots at me in, in an attempt to salvage his relationship with the Saudis, with his peers, with his corporate sponsors. And I was worried after that book, like, are guys going to still talk to me out on tour? But what I found is what it, it increased my credibility because- Well, they the respect players, you. Yeah. The players had always known there was this very wide bridge between the, the public and the, or wide this wide gulf between the public and the private fill. And my book was like this bridge that kind of let people know who he really was for better and for worse. And, and so I had a lot of players come up to me and also caddies and wives and agents say, thank you for writing that book and telling people who Phil, <laughs> yeah, nice daddy. There it is right know, on the bookshelf. Yeah. Who Phil really is. So I think that just cemented in the, the minds of a lot of players. Like, I'm just going to tell it like it is. And if you have something you want to say, like come up to me and let's talk. But, um, you know, we, we all do the job differently and you know, there's, there's other guys on the beat who are a little more gentle and they're, they're more willing to nurture those relationships with the players at the expense of maybe sitting on some really good information. Like I, if I have something good, I never sit on it. Like I, I, my job is to disseminate information and if players are upset about it, I feel like that's really on them and not me. Cause that, again, I'm not a publicist. I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not here to, to be, to do their bidding. Like I, the relationship I really value is with the reader. And so that that's the one that I'm always going to honor and uphold. Yeah, I did enjoy. I was going back through doing a little bit of uh, just like refreshing my brain on it this morning. I was looking at all of JT's tweets and it was he clearly walked it back quite a bit where he was like in some of the replies. He was like, I hear you. A part of media is to tell all sides whether you agree, disagree. Another thing he said was not saying everybody's perfect. We're far from it. Ha ha. Just <laughs> frustrating when it's time after time from unnamed sources commenting about guys bashing them. I do get it's a part of it. So like clearly I think people's reaction was like, what are you talking about? He's supposed to just write positive things about players. Like that's clearly yeah. not his job. So I, I could tell he was walking it back a little bit. Um, yeah. Another, another key moment and and you know i find for for what we do i i find when someone writes a book to be such an incredible undertaking like incredible undertaking of where would you even begin to con to conceptualize it to have to then educate yourself i'm sure on a lot of parts of it and then collect information and then verify information and then put color to that information and it helps that you're an amazing writer but to get so far along in this thing, and we talked about this a few weeks ago when the excerpts really started to uh, make some waves, but when the, when the PGA Tour PIF deal was announced, where were you at with this thing and how much of a headache, impact, <laughs> yeah. et cetera, was that moment? It's a really funny story. So 
I started working on this book last summer and my, my editor at Simon Schuster was basically like, there's no deadline. You know, we're going to follow your lead on this one. And then in probably late January, we had a whole conversation. How's it going? I said, it's going amazing. Like I've learned so much. Like it, the words are flying out of me. And I said, I feel like I feel strongly it has to come out this year because the story is still peaking. And if it, uh, if we wait, you know, who knows what's going to happen? Like I just better be a little soon. And so working backwards, it's like, okay, well, you know, the Christmas time, you get all the big celebrity books. Like, let's try and get out in October before the crush of the holiday season. So then we need the book June 1st, which was an insane deadline, but it had already taken over my life to such extent. It was, it was an element of relief. Like, okay, I, I know I'm going to get you the book You weren't even like a human being at these tournaments. You, you were like a zombie. You were like in the back. I'd be like, are you going to ask a question? You're like, I got I have like two more chapters to do. Like, it's I've bad. got like drool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, no, it, was, it was hardcore, man. I was, I was really working seven days a week and usually till midnight. And, and so you were, I, I uh, had, you were Monahan in that, uh, in that I was. investor had in to, the meeting. <laughs> it had to end. So June 1st uh. became the, June 1st became the deadline. And then my, my editor, he, um, something came up and that was a Thursday. He's like, just take until Monday, which was June 5th. So I, on the night of the fourth, I've never, I've never missed a deadline in my life. So I stayed up super late, put one more coat of polish on it. And June 5th was one of the happiest days of my life. Like I'd had this crushing pressure finally relieved. I went, I got a massage. I took a nap. I took a bath. I took my kids out to dinner. And I fell asleep and I was just like so carefree. And I turned my phone off, but I'd, I'd failed to like silence my computer. And so the next morning before dawn, my, my computer is ringing, ringing, ringing. I'm like, what the fuck? That was June 6th, the day after I turned in the book was the day the framework agreement was announced. And Jay and Yasir were on CNBC and the world was on fire. And um, that was a hard day. Like, I, it was just, you know, it was like, I don't know, it was like running a marathon and you, and you get to the finish line, like, now go sprint 10 miles more. Oh. And so, um, yeah, the next six or seven or eight weeks were crazy. Like I added 15,000 more words, went through the whole manuscript and like tweaked some passages, deleted some stuff, massaged things, changed verb tenses, added some, you know, foreboding, foreshadowing. And um, in the end, I'm happy with the way it worked out because if the framework agreement had come down and the book was already printed, I would have been suicidal. It would have been devastating oh, yeah. because it would have just been like such a gaping hole. And some folks have said, you know, how can you put it out now? We don't know how the story ends, but we really do. I mean, there's there are only three outcomes. Either the, con the framework agreement gets consummated as is, it blows up entirely and they go back to being competitors, live in tour, or this middle ground, which appears to be emerging where they, they bring in some private equity investment alongside the Saudis, dilute the influence and the equity of of the PIF, which makes it more palatable to the players, the fans, and obviously U.S. Congress. And I cover all three scenarios in the last chapter: what it means, how it would play out. So, I think I'm I think I'm covered. You know, come what may, but um, yeah. So I'm happy the way it took a piece of my soul, but I'm happy with the timing and. I mean, to Simon Schuster's credit, like we took this book down to the wire. Like, I mean, I know guys who've turned in books now, they're not going to come out for a year. Like I was still, I was still working on this story deep into August and now the book's out and, you know, that's, I was going to say, even when, you know, when you said you started working on it last summer, like that's an incredibly tight turnaround yeah. for, for a book that's not a novel, right? You can't just right. sit there and fucking write it. Like you have to, yeah. you're on the mercy of other people's schedules and you, you know, you got to chase down this interview or, or you know, chase down that interview. It, it, yeah. It just seemed like it was a, a, a totally hectic process. Um, yeah. are yeah, you surprised? Are you surprised that Monahan is, 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 seems to be making it through this. So he's still in the position that he's in. Oh, he, he gave himself a raise. I mean, he was merely the commissioner of the PJ tour. And now he's the CEO yeah. of all of golf. Like, I mean, he's a, he's a skilled brawler, man. Like he, um, I, I think he's whether what does this, he inspire passion in people? Like, why is he able to do this? You know what he inspires in his players is humanity because Tim Fincham was like this. It's very, those eyes. It's the blue eyes. Maybe. Yeah. But blue, like, you know, the, um, the, the white walkers in, in uh, game of Thrones, but a little bit, like, a little bit. Tim, Tim Fincham was like the school principal. No one knew him. He didn't make any effort to get to know the players on a personal level. He was this stern, remote figure. 
And Monahan is like this garrulous. Yeah, JT like, Post and uh, anecdote. Yeah, there's a great anecdote in this. There's a, a bunch of them. Like Monahan is this very garrulous Irish guy from Boston, and he's really good at human connection. And so that goes a long way. I mean, the players do sincerely feel that he cares and that he's fighting for them. Now, he's made some colossal missteps, as we talked about. But I think you're more willing to forgive that when you have a personal connection with the guy. And, and they do have that with, with, with Monaghan. So that's helped him. But on some level, Liv has already taken its best shot, you know, and they picked off a bunch of players. But there's a great quote from Peter Jacobson in, in the book. Like, it can't be a coincidence all the assholes went to Liv. Like, Nobody in the tour misses Patrick Reed or Sergio Garcia or Bryson or some of these other guys. And so, um, and they've, That's so the, true. the tour has, they have maintained its core, which is it's Tiger, it's Rory, it's Jordan, and it's Rom. We could add Justin Thomas in there to be charitable because I'm a, I'm a, Spieth. I'm a forgiving. Oh, yeah. No, I said Jordan. Can, yeah. No, Spieth for sure. Tell oh, you said Jordan. You're a, That's yeah. right. Yeah. You're so, JT, JT Stan. I can tell. It's very, yeah. very clear. So, yeah. So, like as long as they keep those guys, everyone else is is interchangeable. Because you, imagine if Liv signed Cantlay and Shoffley. Let's say Matt Fitzpatrick, your boy. Maybe we'll throw in Will Zalatoris. We'll give him, you know, a few other guys. Does it change anything? Is that going to send the masses running to the CW? Probably not. I mean, as long as now, if they sign Rory, that's a game changer. We know that's not going to happen. But as long as they keep that core together. They can they can always plug in like like an Obey or there's always new talent coming down the pike, and with the world ranking having closed ranks against Live, that gives that gives the tour a huge recruiting advantage for young talent. So mm -hmm. they they can let some you know Live can pick off some of these these established guys, but they're not really stars. They're good players, but they're not stars. And um, yeah, if if you're young and I I called them out for this on Twitter and he went back at me, but like if you're someone like Eugenio Chikara who was yeah. number four in – or number, might even been number two in the world amateur rankings, and he decides yeah, to go to live. Uh, he was number two. Okay, he decides to go to live without going to the PGA Tour first. He's he's not – there's no pathway for him to play in a major right now. Yeah, well, and and you know, even – and, you know, Chikar, I mean, he we t I interviewed him, about, and he said, like, well, I didn't want – you know, Corn Ferry Tour, you can go broke and wash out of golf. You know, Liv gave me a guaranteed contract to play these live events, and the promise that – if I could always go to the Asian tour, which is two to three times the money of the corn Ferry tour. So for a young guy, it's a calculated risk, but like, look at Taylor Gooch. I mean, he's won three times on live this year. He declared himself, you know, one of the best players in the world last week after he wrapped up the $18 million season long points race bonus. He probably is one of the best players on, on the planet, but how do we know if he doesn't play in the majors? Like we will never know if he gets frozen out of the majors, like how good Taylor Gooch really is. So I think we had a, see that. Had a, a, a very prominent uh, member in the golf media was texting us yesterday about the Taylor Gooch thing and, sh and sending us the screenshot of all of the full field events that he's played over the last year. And his best finish is like 20 something and with a bunch of missed cuts or something like that. It was like making a, a point of being like, how can anybody claim this guy's the top? Like he doesn't, he doesn't even play in real events, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah. um, so you're right. Like, there's no way to really know you could debate it forever, but he's not playing and he's ranked whatever 201st in the world, which feels insane. But yeah, I mean, the majors are the yardstick. And if he, and so if he goes and he contend like, that's that's why Brooks has all the credibility in the world because he did it in the majors. No mm -hmm. one cares that he's won back to back live events in Jeddah, but he won the PGA Championship. He almost won the Masters. Like, okay, Brooks is back, but we only know that because of the majors. So, um, I, I detect, and I'm talking to people at the tour the last week. If I have a story drop in this afternoon on, uh, well, on Tuesday afternoon on FirePitCollective.com, it's kind of an update on the framework agreement and this moment in time. There's a new swagger at the tour because I think they realize they've taken Liv's best shot. They've survived it. They're going to get $2 billion in outside investment, whether it comes from Endeavor or it comes from Rain Capital or it comes from some other US-based firm combined with the Saudis, or maybe they still take the public investment money. But either way, they're going to be sitting on a war chest now uh, to elevate its product to invest in the other tours, to make their TV and their streaming better and all these things. The tour was kind of living paycheck to paycheck like because their whole model was based on squeezing more and more money out of these, these sponsors that were getting tired of the squeeze. 
And they're going to have this investment, whether it's PIF or whether it's U.S. private equity money, where they can finally think big and they can swing for the fences and they don't have to be reliant on, you know, wooing 40 CEOs every year to make to to, to make the model work. So um, I don't think they're afraid of competing against Live Golf. If the Saudis walk away and the framework agreement collapses, the tour will still get its investment from other sources. And yes, Liv will go back to being a competitor. And yes, they will sign some players. But as long as they keep Tiger and Rory and Jordan and Rom, they can just keep plugging other players in. And they, what, and what they have is they have, yeah. And JT. They have, <laughs> they have the prestige. They have the history. And um, that's always going to be enticing to a guy like a John Rom or a Tiger Woods or Rory McIlroy. So, um, and now they, they're the only pathway to world ranking points in the majors. And that's a big domino to fall. So um, it's an interesting moment. But yes, Monaghan appears to like, this is your question from 10 minutes ago. But yeah, Monaghan somehow is going to survive this. He's probably going to consolidate his power. And he's going to be leading a tour that for the first time ever has, you know, billions of dollars in the bank. So uh, it's, it's a, it's a wild turn of events, but he, he may, he may come out of this in a better position than he went into it. Do you think there's a, a decent chance that this is all better for professional golf, that this is turns out at the end of it? Yeah. There was a lot of negativity and flack and hoopla, but that we're going to merge three, four, five years later with professional golf has more, you know, billions more dollars and a more compelling product, especially and you know we haven't mentioned the European tour, but they are part of all of this, and that tour has been withering. So, if the deal gets done with the PIF and whomever, and if we can create a global schedule that makes sense, it would be a monumental victory for golf fans. Like imagine the twelve best tour events, the six best European tour events, and then maybe two or three live style events. And if all the top players showed up for those. And it went around the world. So you, you take one of those to the Australian Open, which is an incredible tournament with a phenomenal mm. history that's pretty much just withered. And then you do that. You do it for the Scottish Open. You do it for some of these great, proud tournaments. Canada, like, Italy, the Irish. Dunhill Lynx. Yeah. Dude, if they did the Dunhill, Dunhill Lynx, Lynx, if everybody went and played there, that'd be awesome. Exactly. And in, instead of like competing for the players, they're all together. Because what, what, what Live Golf has gotten right is you make the players show up to, the, to every tournament. Because when you, you know, I turn on the Texas Open or I don't, you know, I don't want to pick on that one. There's, there's two dozen tour events where nobody's playing that we really care about. And it's a, it's a buzzkill. And it's great for those guys and you create stories. And sometimes you have a very charming winner or an underdog or a, an embattled veteran and you can get sucked into the emotion of it. And that's cool. And that's what the tour is good at is creating the, those storylines, but the casual fan, if, if they turn on and they don't recognize any names on the first page of the leaderboard, they're kind of out. Um, so if you had this, this super schedule, that's um, because the money's so big, all the players will go to, and they're not competing. Like, I mean, like Wentworth is a great tournament and Billy Horschel is like the only American that goes over there. Like if you got, if you got all the top I guys, love that Wentworth, he goes over there. I like is, that he always goes there. It's super cool. I mean, it's one, yeah. one million percent. But um, so that could be the payoff for three years of strife is you get an awesome new schedule that makes sense that all the best players will support. But a few things have to happen for that to come to fruition. I want to. Yeah. Is there enough fan interest for this actually to make money? Because Liv loses a ton of money. And, you know, the, the ratings for the designated events have been bigger for sure, but not. 2x bigger or whatever the purses have gone are are, re, are these people who are looking at this last couple of years you know these people when i say these people i mean the rain capitals the endeavors these massive corporations because they really think there's a there. money Damn. do they think that there's really a money making opportunity here like is there, is there really a sleeping giant is there really all of this fan base that pro golf hasn't broken into or are the saudis just inflated golf sense of self-worth I think it's both because, I mean, we, we know that coming out of COVID, there's been a massive spike in participation in the game. And th there's a lot of ways to measure that, whether it's at Top Golf or it's my my local courses that I used to rock up to in no tea time. And now they're booked out a week in advance. Like, I think it's three years in a row that every equipment manufacturer has had a record year for sales. So there is a robust golf market out there. But all these new fans, are they tuned in to professional golf? I think a lot of them just during COVID, they want to be outdoors. They want competition and they become fans of the game. If you can convert them into hardcore 
fans of the professional game like that's a that's millions of new of new people who are investing in, in the sport emotionally and through their their pocketbooks that I, I don't know the definitive answer to that question but um i think professional sports as a whole is a great investment i mean you look yeah. at what franchises are selling for in every sport the money that's pouring into the english premier league and elsewhere like um and then, then the X factor is all these Wall Street, all these Wall Street guys love golf. They play golf. That's what they, it is. They want they want the access. They want they to want be, the access. you know. They they don't play soccer. They don't play football on the weekends. They play golf. Right. So, yeah. and when people have asked me about the future of live golf, I was like, okay, I've been at these events. Yusir Al Ramayan is having the time of his life. <laughs> like, I, I had I had a cousin who used to pay <laughs> he used to pay fifteen thousand dollars to go to Dodgers fantasy camp to take ground balls with a broken down Steve Garvey. <laughs> Yasir has the ultimate fantasy camp. The, the pro ams, he plays like two holes with Cam Smith. He gets a putting lesson. Then he goes plays, jumps in his cart. He plays three holes with Dustin. He gets he gets a, a lesson on you know how to play a cut off the tee. And then he goes and he he plays like three holes with Phil and he gets a, a lesson on short game. You know, like he's having the time of his life. The one this that I got me relate was, to. I think people yeah. can relate to that. They're like, totally. Dude, this guy's got and, unlimited money. And, he's got $500 and, million dollar yachts. And he's like, I just want to play a couple rounds of golf with Cam Smith and fucking Phil Nicholson. Like, yeah, Alan, the one that got me, that? The, the one that got me was he flew to, I don't remember what it was, some live event the night after Newcastle thrashed PSG in the Champions League. He's there in the in the, in the middle seat in the he has a kick on the field and then he goes to the live event the next day and plays with Phil Nicholson. What a life. What a life. Who wouldn't want yep. that? And um right. so so yeah if if you're if you're a big private equity guy and you're like man I want to be Yasir like I want to party on the yacht with Dustin and Paulina and I want to play in the pro ams and I want to wear the team jerseys and I want to get I want to host the Tuesday night dinners like so Th that's the secret sauce of these guys investing in golf. It, it probably makes sense financially. It definitely makes sense emotionally. Right, right. Uh, what do you think the number for Greg Norman is? What do we, do we have that number? How much money is he making off of all this? I've been trying to get that number forever. Um, and that, like, people have asked me, is there anything in the book you, that you wish you, 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 you could have had, but that you didn't? And I was able to get snapshots on a lot of the dollar figures, but not all of them. Like I would have loved to have just gotten the, someone like literally open the books and get every number. Like that would have been satisfying. It was hard to even get what I got, but um, from a lot of different sources, uh, Norman, he's doing well. I, and, and someone told me he's got a giant golden parachute. So that's why he's kind of unbothered. If, if, if he gets swept out, like I said earlier, he'll still plant the flag of victory. He'll take his eight figure buyout and, and he'll ride off into the sunset. But yeah. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know, but I know that like even the lower level staffers, like some of the people who left the PGA tour to go over to live golf, to, to do administrative things, like they're getting two and three times what they were making before. And so you extrapolate from Norman's importance and his star power. I mean, I'd be, yeah. Monahan's making 14 million, 15 million. I'm sure Norman's making that and probably a lot more. Didn't Jack yeah. say that Jack Nicholas say they offered him a hundred million? He did say that. I mean, the, the live people who were in the room for that meeting, denied that and said, we, we never talked money. It was just conceptual. Um, Jack's 82 years old. He was never going to be the day to day CEO. Like Norman no. was like, I, Jack's kind of, you know, he said I got Jack offered Nicholas. the Greg job. <laughs> yeah, that's right. He was going to offer Jack Nicholas the job to like go to 14 tournaments and be in every meeting. Like that, that's a, that's why I don't really believe what Jack is selling there, but they were talking about creating a Jack Nicholas trophy for like, you know, like the individual champion, like Taylor Gooch, you know, they, they were trying to leverage Jack's credibility and star power, but he was never going to be involved in the day to day. Yeah. All right, Alan. Well, we could do Alan this for Shipnick's hours. <laughs> Fire Pit Collective. Uh, go, go if, if you haven't, go check those guys out. Uh, partner at Fire Pit Collective with one of my favorite people to ever play golf with or hang out uh, around, uh, fittingly enough, a Fire Pit, uh, Matt Janella. So, um, so, yeah, you guys are, are obviously telling stories in phenomenal fashion over there, which, you know, we kind of just react to stories for the most part over here. So it's quite different. And, um, and yeah, congratulations on the book, man. I know, I, I, I don't know, but I can only imagine the undertaking that it is to get something like this to print. I don't want to diminish what all the moms out there have gone through, but it's very much like giving birth. Like, you know, it's um, <laughs> the, the pain and the joy <laughs> and the relief. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Um, but yeah, it, <laughs> it, it is, it is satisfying and it just lives in your head. Like you never stop thinking about it. I'm, 
like I'll have my kids knock on the door. They're like, dad, you've been in the shower for an hour. I'm like, Oh my God, I'm sorry. I was writing chapter 13. Like, you know, you just get, <laughs> you get totally lost in the sauce. And so to, to finally set it free where people can read it and enjoy it and talk about it. Like it, it is, it's, it's probably more relief than anything. It's just like, it's just a, it's a lonely enterprise just sitting there typing it. And so it, it's fun that, that people can now be a part of the conversation like this conversation, which I'm very grateful for. I appreciate you guys having me and, all the insightful questions. Everyone so. needs to go read the book. I mean, it, it, I, Alan's book, all of them are, he writes with a, a joy and a, a, a levity, which I think is really important to have that perspective in this story that is very serious and very, um, it just has wide ranging implications. And I think you, you your tone uh, is a warm embrace for the reader throughout it. So I can't recommend it enough to everyone who's listening right now. Go pick it up, live and let die. Uh, you boys are so nice. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Alan. Uh, this is great stuff. I, I really appreciate your time. We'll do it again uh, soon. We appreciate you. And yeah, go check out the book. Go check out Fire Pit Collective. Uh, and we'll do this again soon. Thank you, Alan. Awesome. Thank you, guys.